Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. This is the uh, regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education, Monday, August 10th, 2020, here at 7 p.m., right here at Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downers Grove's YouTube channel, and the recording will be posted on District 58's YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Joshi. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchick. Here. Member Samanti. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the basket on the table over to my right. Members of the public who are viewing remotely may provide a public comment by submitting the public comment Google form. The link to the form is available on the meeting agenda in board docs under agenda item number 10, public comment. This form is open now for comments and will remain open until we reach that portion of the agenda. I have allotted 30 minutes for public comment, up to three minutes each for in-person comments and, uh, and uh, for those who have submitted cards. I will then read aloud comments submitted remotely in the order in which they were received. In the event that we run out of time to read all the, the remote comments aloud, Please know we will be publishing all comments submitted remotely on the agenda in, in board docs if you would like to refer to them after the meeting. Should there be time remaining, we will take additional in-person comments. We're going to go ahead and kick off the meeting tonight with a flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, the first thing up on uh, tonight's agenda are communications to the board. Uh, listed on tonight's agenda are 111 communications received by the board. Are there any additional comments board members would like to share at this time? No. I do just want to make a comment that uh, we have been working really, really hard to make sure that we follow up with everybody that's written us or requested a phone call with us. So thank you to all the board members who, who've done that. And, um, and for those that we don't follow up with personally, oftentimes it's because we've referred it to the superintendent or a member of staff who's equipped to do that. So thank you to all the members of, to Dr. Russell and your entire team for working diligently to get back to everybody because there's been a lot of questions and comments to follow up on, so thank you. All right, then we're gonna go ahead and, and jump right into reports to the board. We'll start with the superintendent report with Dr. Russell. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start off by talking about COVID-19 and recent events. On behalf of all of us in District 58, I would like to once again thank the student, staff, community for their patience, guidance, and flexibility as we all try and reimagine what schools can look like in the fall. As a, all of us in District 58 will continue to prioritize the safety and well-being of our students and staff. I would like to thank our community for the increased civility that I personally witnessed and experienced over these past two weeks. It is very much appreciated and I continue to be so very proud of our community and how we're conducting ourselves during this challenging time. As your superintendent, I can assure the public that we are simply trying to follow the guidance that has been given to us by the Illinois State Board of Education, the Illinois Department of Public Health, in the DuPage County Health Department. This is what solely drives my recommendations and decisions. While this guidance can change due to conditions at any given time, we must insist on using objective criteria provided by the experts as it is the only path forward. I am not a medical doctor or an epidemiologist. I am an educator that is relying on those in the county and state levels that have expertise in these areas to advise me so I can make informed decisions. The lack of clear instructions from the federal and state government has caused communities to interpret guidance and make decisions on their own. While I am very upset that all 852 school districts have been left to make decisions, please know that we are doing the very best we can under extraordinary circumstances. Let's continue to assume good intentions and extend grace to one another during this time. We all want what's best for our students and staff and I'm confident that we can continue to get there together. Again, thank you for your patience, feedback and collaboration. On a final note, do not hesitate to contact any of us relating to, or with anything related to COVID-19. We welcome the opportunity to hear your thoughts and incorporate your feedback. We have already taken many calls and responded to countless emails. We will continue to do so as communication is key during this difficult time. Just a quick curriculum update. 
The district's or, uh, learn, or return to learn plan was sent out to all families and the deadline for selecting an option was due at noon today. The district also sent out an FAQ for families and staff last week. Finally, the district hosted a YouTube live event for families last Wednesday and will also conduct a similar event for our staff this Wednesday. In terms of finance, the district is busy finalizing the budget for school or for, excuse me, for fiscal year 21. As you can imagine, there are several issues with completing the budget due to COVID-19 and its impact on the district. The district plans to present the tentative budget at a special board meeting on August 24th and then seek final approval at a special meeting on September 28th in accordance with school code. There needs to be 30 days between the tentative budget being passed and the adoption of the formal budget. In terms of facilities, summer projects continue to progress in a normal fashion. Bigger projects like the gym floor at Highland have been completed. I encourage anyone to check out our district Twitter account uh, because we have posted pictures of the new gym floor. It looks really good. Uh, summer deep cleaning is taking place and the final preparation for the return of students and staff is nearing completion. You'll also notice that all of our facilities, we have rented uh, storage units and those storage units are to make room for social distancing for on-site instruction. So those are quickly filling up. We ordered one per location and we do have plans to add a second one at each location should we need that. Special services later this evening will make a recommendation to the board to appoint a new behavioral support systems coordinator. This will finalize the hiring process for our administrative team. In terms of technology, the technology department has continued to prepare for the upcoming school year. Uh, new HP Chromebooks have been set up and delivered to middle schools. These devices are for eighth graders who will exchange their Dell Chromebooks when school begins. Remember, we let our students keep their Chromebooks over the summer. Most seventh grade students picked up their Chromebooks though in June. Last week, we began exchanging devices for third grade students who switched to the Logitech keyboard case devices. Devices for first grade students are set up and ready for the start of the school year as well. Unfortunately, the iPads ordered after the July board meeting have not yet arrived. We are hoping to get them on site in the coming weeks so that we can have devices ready for kindergarten students. Faculty have been exchanging their MacBooks throughout the summer and we're excited that we have access to improved devices as we start the school year. We have also migrated several services from on-premise to hosted solutions, including PowerSchool and Destiny. Once our website migration is complete in the coming weeks, we will have moved our three largest um, things off to servers. This is part of a longer term plan to simplify our long term on premise storage needs. The student information team has completed the rollover process and upgraded to the latest version of PowerSchool. Schedules are built, though we still have time to adjust them due to reconfigurations based, based on our return to learn plan. The team is ready to work quickly with administrators to set up new class lists for on-site and online academy students. That concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you so much. Is there any questions at this time for Dr. Russell? All right. Well then, he's already on his way. Welcome, Todd Dreyfald. Uh, <laughs> our, our next three reports are the monthly business and the treasurer's report. And, and uh, mine will be probably as quick as it was to get from here to, uh, to my seat. Um, you have a uh, adjusted June 30th uh, year-to-date report in your packet. Uh, as we noted to the board, uh, we had some adjustments uh, mainly due to grants uh, and expenditures that needed to be posted on those that happened after we had reported those uh, to you in July. So that's an updated uh, June 30th piece. It was just some additional expenditures, not, not significant. Uh, but we want to make sure those get in so we can uh, get reimbursed from a grant for those. Additionally, uh, you don't have a year-to-date report for July um, because, again, as we've talked about the and, and as uh, Dr. Russell had just pointed out, you know we have adjusted a bit our budget calendar and schedule. Uh, when we have a tentative budget uh, in the final, then we will be able to do that year-to-date report, and we'll go back and repost July. You know, show you July's and then August as well. So that'll be at the in the, the September board meeting. Uh, other than that just been busy getting ready for school and uh, we had a FAC meeting that we uh, talked a little bit about and, and I'm sure Mr. Uh, President Hughes will go through that in, in that committee report unless there are questions. Todd, I had a question. I'm yes. looking at the uh, percent, of, percent of budget column on the year-to-date year -to -date report. Mm -hmm. I would have expected us to be more than 0.3% under budget given some of the savings on transportation. Could you explain <coughs> how we got so close to the <coughs> annual budget? 
Yeah, we, uh, yes, because there was savings in the transportation piece. Uh, we, um, was a few places we knew we were gonna go over. Um, we weren't too worried about that. Uh, but then what we did was try to put in where we knew we had some things that we were gonna be able to buy and do for this next year, knowing it was gonna be tight. Uh, we, we, st we put those in in that time frame where, you know, when, when operations and everything was shut down and everyone was remote. Uh, we probably put up a little more than we needed to because uh, it got a little closer than I'd like to have gotten. Um, and then we had some revenue not quite hit, but on the expense side, you're right, we, we came a little more than I would have, you know, I would have probably held back a few, but we wanted to make sure we were able to, to do that and get some of those things going so we had them in an, in time depending on what the schedules were going to be. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. Welcome. Appreciate it. Okay, the policy committee did not meet in uh, June. The legislative committee did not meet in June. But the financial advisory committee, uh, as Mr. Drayfall just stated, did. We met on August the 7th uh, via Zoom. Uh, it, we spent a lot of time in that particular meeting looking at, um, one, the report going back to that, that June 30th close and those adjustments. And we had the same questions in that room. What happened? Uh, and it was uh, discussed that fiscal year 21, we moved up some of those expenses there uh, to, to kind of help balance those things and to kind of get some of those purchases moving in preparation uh, for this year. Uh, we had some discussions on the impact of CPI and while it's in the positive number right now, it's floated around zero or even negative. So we're continuing to take a, a look at what the impact of that is gonna be. It's really anybody's guess at this time exactly what the economy is gonna look like. Uh, we did have a request in that meeting um, to going forward in our next meeting. We, we're going to schedule one in September. Normally, we only meet every other month. Uh, but to, to have a look at the CPI tables and just look at the trends and, and understand what's going on there. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about the long-term budget, what's happening in not only 21, but 22 and 23, and what the impact of some of this stuff can be. Uh, it was a preliminary conversation. It was a good conversation. But we are going to meet next month in... Normally we wouldn't meet, but with the way everything is shifting with the budget, we're going to talk about and approve a preliminary budget on the 24th. Normally we would have done that in this meeting. And then, um, so everything's off a little bit because we're waiting kind of for final numbers on the impact of COVID-19 and, and, and all of these um, additional expenditures and stuff that we're trying to figure out for the year. So um, we, we just kind of planted a seed with the team as a whole on everything that we're doing, what the impact could be long term. and. Um, so that we can have some discussions on that and, and hopefully then facilitate some conversations here amongst the board and make sure that we have a better understanding of at once we get into the kind of the beginning of this school year, have a real hard look at what all of our financial impact is gonna be. I, you know, there's a lot of speculation that we, you know, there could be bailouts or something. I, I think it's safe for us to, to assume at this point that we're not gonna get a dime. And if we get one, then that's great. Uh, and as we talked about before, the, TIF is falling off in Downers Grove, but we had aspirations to use that money in a different way. So we are disappointed, but that may be the thing that helps keep us afloat right now, but that's not an ideal way for us to, to spend that money because we do have expenditures that we have to deal with. So, um, and obviously we just kind of reviewed the fact that any kind of talk of referendum or facilities master plan has just kind of been put on hold. So that's kind of kind of where we were at. I don't you want to interject anything else that we talked about in that meeting? No, I, I think you summed up quite well as, as always, Darren, but I think uh, the one theme that was, was clear is, all right, you know, once we kind of get past this triage state, mm -hmm. we definitely need to get back to the, the longer term discussions. And, um, you know, we do have operational needs across all 15 buildings, so we kind of got to remember where we, where we were at um, you know, five months ago. So I think uh, once we kind of get over these next couple months, we can get back to those important, um, you know, issues that we need to address. Excellent point. That's absolutely right. Uh, any questions? Uh, all right, then that concludes my report. All right, uh, the district leadership did not meet in June. Uh, the health and wellness committee did not meet in July. Do we know when the next the, uh, health and wellness committee meeting is? Or, yeah. That, that'll be in September. We'll have to get, we'll see what we can do to do one in August um, because the board will have to, the committee will have to meet and look at and review and make a recommendation for any rate adjustments 
uh, to the board by the October board meeting so that uh, you we can make those changes for open enrollment for January. Great, thanks. Okay, that brings us uh, to our discussion items here tonight. Uh, we only have one discussion item, it is the return to learn plan update. We have asked Dr. Russell tonight to just kind of give us, uh, as we, coming out of the last meeting, one of the things we talked about was wanting to kind of continue to get information because everything seems fairly fluid. So we've asked, I think this is going to be an ongoing uh, item that we're going to have on the next several meetings. So welcome, Dr. Russell, back to the podium. And I promise this one will not be three hours long. So uh, <laughs> I think this will be a good relief for everyone. Uh, the assistant superintendents will also join me for uh, their pieces in this. And then, of course, when we're all done, we'll go ahead and answer board questions. So the objectives that we want to make sure that we cover tonight is, as you're aware, that uh, enrollment decisions were due today at noon. So we want to provide the board with current enrollment data and other information like transportation. And we'll provide that information to you in terms of all the people that responded and then the people that didn't respond. And so we'll, we'll give it to you in two different formats so you can take a look at that. Uh, we also want to discuss start and end times to the school year, as the board is aware. We uh, put tentative times out there, but we had to work with our transportation uh, provider, especially with District 99, now going back to a hybrid model. So that did have an impact on our start and end times. We want to discuss the next steps for planning and staffing uh, for the on-site uh, and the uh, virtual academy, as well as our thoughts around remote learning. We want to update the board on news from the Illinois Department of Public Health, or lack thereof, and the DuPage County Health Department, uh, or lack thereof as well. And I think you're going to kind of get a sense of what I'm going to share with you later. And then, of course, we're available to answer uh, board questions. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to the assistant superintendents and let them uh, take their sections here. So uh, Dr. Ike Miller always does a fantastic job with our data, and he's going to go ahead and share all of the uh, responses that we got in terms of parental commitment. Thank you. Uh, so as Dr. Russell mentioned, the form is closed today at noon. And uh, to kind of summarize the data, overall right now we have 4,980 students registered in the district. Uh, that's excluding our outplay students. So that's students registered pre-K through eight in, in our 13 schools. So we received a, spons a response for 4,207 students. Um, and, and I just preface that with the, the the approach we took to gathering this data was to make it as easy as possible for families, which unfortunately made it more challenging for us on the data end. We do have some capabilities we're looking at to put this into PowerSchool to actually align it with the students and make the data a little bit cleaner. Uh, but we felt at this point throwing something new at parents and having them having to log into PowerSchool and, and do it with their accounts would have been uh, challenging. And I, I think it also, we would have gotten fewer responses in. So, but with that, you'll, you'll see some of the numbers just don't align. So for example, I just said we had a response for 4,207 students, and yet there were 4,516 responses to the form. Uh, and, and you contribute that to a, a variety of things. There were a lot of duplicate entries, parents that did it a couple of times. Uh, there were some students that haven't actually registered yet that filled it out. And there were just kind of some other errant data, as you can imagine, parents going in and, and working on that. So there was definitely some cleanup on our end uh, that we had to do on the data on that side. Uh, but we have most of that done, at least uh, up to this point. So that leaves 773 students that we did not receive a response for. Um, you know, you'll hear me allude this to a couple times. Our approach to that is you know, we need to begin planning. Uh, we, we've got to start, our, our principals are, and uh, assistants and pretenders are very eager to start figuring out what their class lists are going to look, class lists are going to look like and setting all that up. We need to make staffing decisions as uh, you know, Dr. Zentis is going to refer to in a little bit. But so all that data requires us to have a decision for each student. So the default decision for any student uh, for whom we didn't have a response was to uh, enroll them in on-site learning. Um, so we will be contacting families, uh, and I'm getting a little bit on myself, we'll be, we'll be contacting families about this to try to clarify that as best we can. So again, the, the lens for this first is just, uh, for these first few slides is the form responses. So I kind of wanted to share the data as it was submitted, recognizing that at the end I'll circle back around to what we actually have in PowerSchool inclusive of all of our students. But I felt it was important to at least share the data that was submitted as we saw it. So, Again, 4,516 responses, and uh, the, we ended up with 75% selecting on-site learning and 23.1% selecting the online academy, uh, and, the, and a, a small number of students that are, uh, or families that are looking to have their child withdraw for the first trimester. And, and uh, there's a lot going on in this chart. This just kind of gives you the, the, the bird's eye view of the percentage from each school, and the, the, the darker blue being on-site, the lighter blue being online academy, and the pink being withdrawal. 
Uh, you, you'll notice that the three schools that have the highest withdrawal numbers are, are schools that include preschool. Uh, and again, that was a little bit of a data entry. Some parents clicked Grove Children's Preschool, some parents clicked Indian Trail, some cl clicked Henry Puffer, uh, but then we were able to capture that with a pre-K question too. Uh, so, but again, those are our highest numbers there. Uh, and then, you know, you, you just see some variance, you know, going anywhere from the low 60s to the, uh, to the upper 80s, depending on the school. And again, these are people that responded, uh, or families that responded to the survey. This data may not be entirely clean, as I alluded to, because we did have some duplicate entries, and we had some parents that submitted it twice. And they changed their mind for, you know, because these were obviously really challenging decisions for our community. So, but again, this is just the form, the data as it was submitted um, uh, in the Google Drive. <coughs> again, you can see a picture here in this chart by grade level. Uh, as I alluded to previously, you see the highest number of withdrawals at pre-K and then kindergarten, and then some, you know, and again, a, a little bit more at the, uh, the, in the primary grade levels, uh, and, and then very, you know, far fewer as we move up. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, you can pick out a few trends from this data, but pretty consistent you know, from, from grade levels, uh, you know, in that 70 to 80% to ish range for electing for on site learning. We did ask a question about uh, bus usage. And so uh, you know, this is similar to the data that we saw uh, uh, in our previous survey, uh, but you know, I, I think we have an even higher percentage of our families that are going to opt for not utilizing the bus. Again, you know, some, some challenging work here will be actually getting this down to the student level and making sure we know uh, which students are riding the bus, because I know the uh, visit department is working hard and making sure we have all those routes set up. Uh, but this just gives us an idea of that utilization at the initial level. Uh, and then I know there's a lot of information out there, but, but uh, you know, we are working closely to do our best to, to see what District 99 is doing and then make decisions, you know, one, in alignment with them as it's important, and then also as what we think is best for our instructional model. And again, uh, this is some things that uh, Mr. Sissel will refer to. Uh, so we want to get a sense from our families, how important is it to align? Do we need to wait and see what District 99 does? Or do we kind of want to move forward to what we think is best for District 58? Uh, and, and you can see there's some variance in responses, but we had uh, a lot of families that felt that aligning with District 99 was not extremely important. Um, so I, I think that this was a, a telling piece of data for us to get, and I think really will help uh, will help us as we're planning for those middle school schedules. Again, this is, I, I should clarify that, this is a middle school only question, because uh, really focused on our blended model compared to uh, their blended hybrid model and, and determining the importance of alignment. So that takes us through the survey. So at that point today, at noon, one of the first jobs that we had to take from a data perspective was you know, once we had all the, the, the student 58 numbers uh, aligned, was now let's drop this into power school and actually look at our total student, en student enrollment and really start taking steps to, start, uh, to begin planning uh, what the classes are going to look like, how large the classes are going to be, and, and all that. So really to do that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's James, why don't you pause there so we can make sure that sure. Um, we're still live streaming? Okay. okay. Craig, <laughs> get away from the lights. <laughs> <laughs> we're still live streaming. Do we need to restart? I'm the guessing these are emergency lights? or No, we're still live streaming. We oh, still okay. got Wi Fi and stuff. So. Just enough to knock the projector. Yeah. The projector um, I feel like the HVAC no, turned off right. too. Yeah, I think because they flickered, they just went out and run. My okay. computer is still charging. Live streaming, we just we lost the projector, so we're, we're bringing back online. <laughs> Thank you for confirming. Okay, <laughs> uh, apologize for the short break there. Um, so, uh, as I was mentioning, we really want to get to work on actually aligning this data with our students. So, we, we, we had to take those 773 students for whom we did not have a response and we just put them in the on site option. Uh, Tomorrow, our plan is that we're going to work working on a communication. We'd like to email all 4,980 families 
for the message, the, you know, and the student name. This is the option that we have on record. If you have any questions or concerns, uh, please contact your school office and our, our school secretaries. Principals will know how to make the adjustment in power school. Uh, so hopefully as quickly as possible, we can connect with as many families as possible and ensure that we have the right data. Again, because uh, it's really difficult to move forward with our planning without knowing which route uh, or which uh, option each student is going to be in. So uh, the next three sides, so again, just to be fully clear and fully transparent so you understand, the next three sides include those 773 students being shifted to, on, to the on-site option. So really, this is just to give you a picture of what those numbers look like with all of our students. Uh, again, uh, you see, unsurprisingly, you see the percentage of on-site uh, go up a little bit, you know, but not much. It gets us a, a little bit closer to 80% for on-site and around 19% uh, for online academy. Again, that's accounting for those students that were shifted. Again, I won't, I won't go too deep into these, but just so you can see the data, you know, you can see, again, some small changes in a couple of our schools, uh, as, uh, you know, which is, again, indicative maybe of a little bit of a higher non-response rate, but so you see the shift there for our schools. Uh, again, I'm happy to answer any questions about anything specific. Again, I'll, I'll kind of um, breeze through this one again as well, but here's the updated numbers for each grade level. Again, uh, not any uh, significant shifts, but obviously the on-site ticked up a little bit. Uh, pretty consistently across all uh, of the 10 grade levels. So, and I think that is all that I have, and I will pass it on to Mr. Sissel, who's going to Quick speak question for you, James. Yes, sir. Um, the follow-up email that you're going to do, you said that's just going to go to everybody and kind of, it's more like a confirmation. This is what we have on record for you. Confirm that this is Correct. The, yeah, I, I envision three I emails. Like well, one email to the online ac academy families, one email to the on-site families, and one email to the withdrawal families. And, and it'll, it has a... I think we could kind of uh, mail merge, so to speak, the student name in there. So a, a parent that has three children would get three emails and, and have the choice for students. So yeah, the short answer, yes, to go to all, <laughs> all of them. Great, thank you. You're welcome. As Dr. Russell mentioned, we wanted to talk a little bit about the start and end times. Um, looking first at on-site instruction, the box that's on the screen is what was published on Friday. And as Dr. Russell alluded to, part of the reason that this was published on Friday is because we were awaiting confirmation primarily with our transportation vendor, with First Student, to ensure that these times were feasible. We do share buses with District 99, and so we've been working to make sure that we are not putting ourselves in a position where the routes would be too tight, particularly with some of the additional components of bus riding in, in, in this situation. So what we had published spoke to the intervals of time that we were looking for and what we have now, or what we have published a week prior, I should say. What's now up there is what we are, are looking at. And so I mentioned, obviously, transportation is a consideration. Um, another consideration is the thought of, for all of our buildings, working to develop a, a staggered arrival and dismissal time, where we'd be asking the support of, you know, our, our students who may walk or our families who may drop off in cars. Some of our schools, as you know, don't have buses and, and are all walkers or car riders. And one of the things we're working to try to do is, is think about how we can avoid having three or four hundred students arrive simultaneously to each school. So that's where some of those times are, where 8.50 a.m. would be the time we would really want to see pretty much everyone within school. The buses may actually arrive a little bit earlier than that in some cases as we work through some of those individual routes and scenarios. And so those are, that's an example, and I'll, I'll say this a couple of times in a couple of brief slides, of the things we are now working full speed ahead on with our building administration and working through building level procedures to really get all of those things firmed up. So. That is the, you know, the on-site piece. The other thing we want to remember is, uh, well, two things, actually. You know, one is if the, district, if the buses can't get to our schools until 1.10 for the elementary schools, you know, one, one option would be to keep that earlier 8.30 time and just extend the day even further. The reality is we're very conscientious about how long we are going to have students between full meals. How, what is the distance we're placing between breakfast and lunch in these models, even though we would have a snack at school. We want to be conscious of that. The other thing, you know, there was a suggestion that, well, couldn't we just move the start time way up and, and get ahead of District 99's afternoon interval? And the reality is we know that with arrival procedures, there are more steps to take in terms of certification and temperatures and all those kinds of things, and we want to ensure that we're allowing ample time in, in the morning side of things for those procedures to be done thoroughly and completely with on-site instruction. So that's the, the, the sort of the rationale behind the, that, that slight shift in on-site instructional time for our students in, in the elementary school buildings. To speak a bit about the online academy times, 
We've definitely had a number of questions about this, and, and what, we, what we can commit to tonight, certainly, is that the instructional day for the online academy will be completed between 8.15 and 2.30, 8.15 a.m. and 2.30 p.m. That, would, that full five clock hours will be theoretically accounted for in a schedule that, that is within there. The reality of individual student schedules is that we are still finalizing the development of that because we really want to think about how we're going to structure that synchronous versus that asynchronous time in the online academy. There are, we've discussed a model in which you might have two and a half hours almost straight through of synchronous instruction in the morning and then your afternoon would be asynchronous. That would then necessarily flip so that some students would have the morning asynchronously and the afternoon synchronously. We've also talked about the idea that it might be better to break that up a little bit and have, you know, where you would join a nine o'clock Zoom call and then a 10.30 Zoom call and they would stagger throughout the day. This is another one of those things we want to finalize with some teacher input in terms of what we think will make the most cohesive instructional model. So those specifics, we're still, on, we're still developing over the next really few days. Um, but in terms of the overall component, it will be between that 8.15 a.m. and 2.30 p.m. time with a space for, for lunch allowed for students that are at home and things like that. Finally, the transition um, days, September 1st through 4th and 8th and 9th, those aren't published on this screen, but we did send those out as well. Um, we published those times for grades one through six. We have not yet published the times for preschool and kindergarten. And that again is precisely because we are waiting for a little bit more teacher input on the specific structures of those days. I believe in one of the presentations we've talked about a couple of different really um, child-centered ideas of having sort of appointment-based ideas in those first couple of transition days where three or four families may bring a kindergarten student to meet the teacher outside and do smaller group types of things. But that truly is an idea that has been batted around by a few teachers. I think we're really trying to be cognizant of including staff in planning as much as we can while recognizing that the, the, the staff is volunteering time and now coming in for some curriculum development time this summer, which I'll talk about on the next slide. So we expect to have those things worked out in collaboration with building administrators and preschool and kindergarten staff very soon. We just, I, I, you know, I, I never taught kindergarten, and so I don't think it's necessarily appropriate for me to dictate exactly what that meaningful transition is going to look like for teacher and student in those first two days. You can go to the next slide. So as we look at some of the things, some of the many things that are happening over the next couple of weeks, the first thing I want to highlight is the curriculum development work. This actually began this morning with grade level teams in grades three through six. We've asked a lot of our teachers over this summer between the remote learning task force and the working groups that happened in July. And we have another 70 or 80 teachers who have jumped on and said, yes, I will come in over the next two weeks and start doing the work that will benefit all students and all of my colleagues as we work to define those essential standards and work on that scope and sequence and really think about what trimester one instruction is going to look like for all of those areas. Our middle school teachers will meet by departments. We'll have our elementary specialist teachers. By the end of the next couple of weeks, we'll have met with all these groups. And what's nice about this work is this will impact all students regardless of the instructional model. The, the, the essential standards and the scope and sequence we outlined will be similar for the online academy as they will for on-site instruction, as they would be if we ultimately were in a situation where we transitioned at some point into a full remote scenario. And that consistency piece that we talked about in the spring is the piece that we are really trying to build with fidelity right now so that as teachers begin instruction, we know what the end of first trimester is going to look like and we can all align toward those goals. Another conversation that we've had a lot of questions around is math acceleration and what will that look like? Our math committee met last Friday and, and had a, a very in-depth conversation about a variety of different models that we could implement to achieve math acceleration. Um, we're working with our building administrative team to talk through some of these tomorrow. This is a great example of where we will have a couple of paths to achieve math acceleration, just like we did pre-COVID. They will be implemented ever so slightly differently at buildings based on the configuration of on-site classes and online academy classes and the number of students who are eligible for accelerated math in any given building. And that segues nicely into the next bullet, which is another major piece of work that we're doing over the next week. Dr. Udentis and I have basically split up our 13 buildings and each of us are serving as point person for the building administration in six and seven respectively of those buildings to sit down frequently with our principals and really talk about what are those instructional spaces going to look like? How are we going to configure those? How are we going to make those decisions together? What kinds of instructional procedures, what kinds of, um, you know, 
accommodations need to be made in those spaces so that we are ready for on-site instruction. It also extends into staffing, which I won't talk about because that's a couple of bullets down, but those are the conversations we're now shifting into the building level to really, with the, with the actual numbers that Dr. Eichmiller referenced, we can start to make these tangible decisions and there will be a lot of them happening over the course of the next few days. All right, speaking of accommodation, that's a nice segue into special education. So now that we're aware of families' decisions um, for those that have uh, students with special needs, for the next two weeks, our buildings are gonna be working on really looking at what are the supports and services needed for students that are attending both on site and in remote instruction and starting to work on schedules that would allow our staff to support them appropriately. All of that leading towards um, being prepared to have in-depth conversations with parents where we're really talking about some models of support that we could offer and really work through um, what would make sense for each of those students. Um, as a reminder to, uh, to our community, uh, these plans are, are temporary learning plans. They will not replace in any long-term way the comprehensive individualized education plans and 504 support plans that were crafted last year, but instead is, is really just a kind of a, a roadmap for this time uh, until we can return to, to full in-person instruction. Okay. In the, over the next two weeks, as we look more closely at our staffing, um, as you've heard already, we have our numbers that will really, as of noon today, we can now dig in to the specific um, the breakdown of how many students by grade level at each building for our on-site learning, our online academy, we initially, in our planning, prior planning, had talked about that possibility of some staff members needing to serve as classroom teachers when maybe last year they were a reading specialist. So every one of those employee groups is aware of that potential change. Really what our work looks like now in these next few days is digging in, circling back to those employees to talk through, you know, yes, we are going to um, partner you or have you work as a classroom teacher. I already have the information just from the individual um, communications thus far. So for example, a gifted teacher in our elementary gifted program who may go in and now teach in a classroom, really those staff members have shared, you know, when I was in the classroom, I was third grade. If you could, if you could place me in third grade, that would be great. So really we've, we've been very careful to keep the interests of our employees in mind and match as we match those grade levels. So that will really be this, the work the next few days. Um, as Mr. Sissel mentioned, that goes along, that part of that work is with our building principals. So once we really look by building and identify, this, here's a specific staff, and then it's working with that, the building administrator or administrative team to then look at spaces and really place teachers in the grade levels with then a follow-up communication coming from me to any employee who is shifting roles from last year to this year. Um, and then similarly with the online academy, identifying how many staff members we will need to support that process. Um, as I'll talk a little bit more on the next slide with personnel, really maybe matching some teachers who it would be beneficial based on some of their personal or family circumstances related to health that could, could support that, that program as well. The other piece of staffing is looking at our substitutes. Um, as of a couple weeks ago, we had 170 teacher substitutes confirmed, and I know we have more on that list. I just don't have that updated number. Um, so we've, we've reached out and are continuing to reach out. We also, in anticipation of the potential for some of our staff members needing to be on a short-term leave um, or potentially a, a long-term medical leave, I've already reached out to some of our regular consistent subs that we typically use for long-term leaves just to have some people ready for filling those spots so that is already in the works um, and have a good list built there. With our bus monitor positions, um, some of that work really will be finishing up this week with the business office as we look at transportation, knowing how many buses we have, how many routes, which then there really are three pieces to the bus monitor staffing. One would be working with our association, our, our ESP association, to look at employees who want to shift their hours to start earlier and do the bus piece as part of their workday. The second option would be then 
um, reaching out to staff members who may want to pick up additional hours, keeping their, their work day as an instructional assistant, but then pick up that additional hour for the bus route. And then the third piece really is that outreach throughout the community for adding additional positions for whatever that time allocation is once I have that from, from Todd and Katie in the business office. And then finally with staffing, as we've been working the last few weeks and we will continue to work, we really are also planning for that rem remote learning contingency and what that could look like. Um, there are a couple different scenarios as we plan for that possibility of going remote and it, re it really will depend on the timing that may determine that best decision at that time. But that is part of our planning, especially with our assistant soup team as we um, plan for our next steps. And then looking a little uh, more closely at personnel, there, there are individual employee circumstances which we knew we would be working through. Um, and so I wanted to get, provide the board with a little information. This really is coming from all employee groups and that's important to keep that in mind. It's, we have 650 employees, so it's teachers as well as instructional assistants, secretaries, custodial and maintenance um, employees, so it's all of us. At this point, you know, there are, there are different levels, if you will, of the conversations that I'm having with individual employees. Several weeks ago, we had an initial survey to staff, and at that point, staff members were to indicate yes, if they felt that they would need follow-up, maybe there was a medical reason why they could not safely come back to work. Um, and so that was my initial trying to catch and, and be proactive and identify some of those people. So I've started that follow-up, we have since sent additional communications through the staff FAQ, again asking employees to reach out to me directly just so we can have, again, a good sense of what we need to plan for and how many staff members. It's also was very helpful, our, I can, our Teachers Association president also sent a communication for, to staff last week, again saying if you have um, feel that there may be a reason you need a leave, a medical leave, or maybe a childcare reason, please reach out to me in the personnel office. And so we feel like we have a good sense of our numbers. At this point, looking at that medical certification, that would be employees with fairly significant personal health diagnosis or conditions that would um, not make it possible for them to come to work. So we have two, uh, I'm sorry, three employees who will require that medical leave of absence Again, that's not one of them as a teacher, the other two are from other employee groups. We then have, as we're making decisions and we get more information about the individual scenarios, another two employees who have that medical certification from the doctor, but they are still able to work. And so at that point, we go to that next step conversation with the doctors to, we need to first identify what is the position that they will hold for this coming school year and then talk about any possible appropriate accommodations for the person to be able to work on site and, and see if we can't work through that piece. Um, or if not, you know, then that kind of, that drives that, that next step conversation as to is it a medical leave or do we, is there a different way we can support those two individuals. The next, really the majority of the people that have, the staff that have reached out so far really it was kind of that unknown of we don't know what the plan is yet so I do have some concerns or maybe I care for someone who has a medical condition I'm worried or it's my own health situation but I'm not quite sure what that means for me um, with coming back on site so really as I've worked through emailing and phone calls with individuals the majority of that group really um, through the, the accommodations we were already providing and the safety measures for all staff, those situations have been revol resolved in that by, by providing the masks, which we were for all staff, we're also providing face shields for any employee who would ask for the face shield, we can accommodate that. We've looked at plexiglass, so for example, in our offices, we've installed the plexiglass in offices, so that has again resolved some of these that second bullet are not really medical accommodations that are required from a doctor. It's more the district working with our employees to say, hey, we can, we can accommodate this. Let's talk about what do you need and we'll put it in place. Um, and so we have been very successful thus far 
working one by one through each of those situations. The next piece to consider is that, that child care concern. As you know, this situation is impacting all families, everyone. Um, and so really we have, our employees have to figure out what does that mean for my own children? What is their school fully remote? Are they on site? And there is um, the option through the Families First Coronavirus Response Act for an employee to request time off for child care if their schools are closed. And the definition of if schools are closed would be a, a scenario where the school is fully remote, not a blended or a modified scenario. Um, in this situation so far, and I think our, our staff's been doing a wonderful job of really trying to figure out other options. We do have a few people right now. One um, request has been approved. We have seven others who are working through some kind of request they have not yet submitted, but we may, we may see some people asking for partial days. Really, they're trying to get coverage for half of their day, and that way they only have to request a leave for the other, the second half of the day, an AM, PM scenario. Um, but under this act, basically an employee could, re could request the time. It would be two-thirds salary. They would be two-thirds a day. They could use a third of a sick day, and it's for up to 12 weeks. Um, Thus far, with our employees, they're really wanting to start at just that four-week time frame and, and are really working towards, no, I want to continue other, to find other options for childcare because I want to be in school. I want to obviously be with my students. So people are, I mean, I think they're doing a wonderful job trying to work through that, and we will continue to work through those scenarios as they arise. Um, the other piece to that is as that's, you know, as I'm working through these, we are also identifying substitutes for those positions, so we will be prepared to have um, someone in the classroom with our kids. And then the, the final scenario really is there, there's, at this point, one person, but as you know, this, the pandemic has caused all people to have to make some personal choices and really think about what's best for your family, for your work, and so in some cases, there, there's the struggle and a person who may choose my, my children's school is open I can send them to on-site personally I'm, I'm not going to do that um, and so in that case I'd rather resign than than send my kids and again it's that it's really difficult personal choices but we do have one person um, in that situation thus far We have been working with and in communications with um, uh, our partners in, in daycare. We have Champions that does before and after care. And so we've been working with them um, and going through our protocols and what they will need to do. And they will follow through that and you know, people can contact them directly. Um, they're also working with uh, kinder care and expanded options um, for half day kindergarten. Additionally, the Park District through the LINK program will have uh, options available for folks and they will be able to provide transportation uh, by the Park District and people should be contacting both of those. Uh, I know Champions uh, is getting ready or can send out an e you know, information to parents um, that have previously been in their, their system uh, to cover those type of things. Before I get to the IDPH and the DuPage County Health Department, uh, champions, if they are using our facilities, are bound to follow the exact same regulations uh, that we would have to follow as a school district. Also, I do want to uh, thank Bill McAdam at the Park District uh, for all the work that his staff have done uh, to ensure that our, our families have options. And one of the things that was of particular interest to both Bill and myself was that we didn't want to just dump kids into the park district where they wouldn't be following social distancing or making sure that they're being safe. Uh, fortunately for us, our park district has a great deal of experience in this, especially with summer care. And they develop pod systems where they're keeping uh, kiddos six feet apart and masks and, and really adhering to the same guidelines that we would be under uh, by the DuPage County Health Department. So I do want everyone to understand that if we're partnering with someone like the park district and or champions, that they are still following our uh, regulations. Uh, when we talk about champions in our schools, 
we'd be targeting uh, the gymnasium for those particular spots. Um, the reason we want to do that is those spaces are not being used as instructional spaces. And, and so when the kids are there in the morning, you would then be able to clean that area and then you know use it again after school and then it would get deep cleaned as well. So we don't want to use the same instructional spaces because that requires obviously deep cleaning as you have different groups going. So it will be limited, uh, but limited to the amount of students that you'd be able to fit in a, in, in a gymnasium. So you're looking at uh, approximately 45 students, uh, perhaps, depending on enrollment needs, because you still need to keep space for the adults in that room, and you'd be limited to 50 students per space. Want to take some time to update the board on where we're at with the Illinois Department of Public Health and the DuPage County Health Department. <clears throat> I've spoken several times throughout this process that this is an ever-evolving process because guidance continues to be updated, guidance continues to come out, and then sometimes guidance can change. And so know as your superintendent that I am in contact with all of our neighboring superintendents and really trying to digest this information. Sometimes we have to seek the advice of legal counsel. Sometimes we have to ask our own county health department for more clarification. And sometimes we are frustrated, uh, all cards on the table, with the lack of information coming from the state when they say that they're going to get it to us. Uh, you know, we are fortunate in District 58 that we've stuck to more of a traditional schedule in terms of when school starts and we even back that up. Remember when high school shifted to a model where finals went before winter break, they're now starting school this week or next, which you know, I really feel for some of our high school colleagues because they're trying to make these decisions before this guidance is finalized. So it is a very, very tough position for school districts that we're in. One of the things that we've been asking the Illinois Department of Public Health to do is to give the county health departments the authority to shut down schools if they need to. Not just a recommendation, but to give them that actual authority. Now, we've committed in District 58 to follow their recommendation, but we still nevertheless have been advocating for our local health department to make that decision because DuPage County knows our school district a heck of a lot better than Springfield does. So there is a legislative committee in Springfield that oversees the IDPH. On Friday, they posted um, a set of emergency rules that they are going to adopt tomorrow. I should say going to adopt, they're going to vote on that tomorrow. That would give the health department the ability to shut down a, a, a school if they deemed that uh, numbers were too high in the community or for whatever reason for uh, health concerns during an emergency. Um, I hope we would never have to get to that here in District 58 or any other district. But having that authority as a health department is something I, I think that makes all of us sleep a little better at night knowing that they're the experts who can do that. We are waiting for clarification from the Illinois Department of Public Health. They have put out a lot of guidance specifically around when students would have to isolate if they test positive or staff and when someone would have to isolate if they have a symptom or symptoms. And we are waiting for that guidance to come out because it doesn't take care of all the little nuances that you could find yourself in. So let me give you an example. One of the things that we're seeking clarification on, because it could greatly impact our instructional model that we can deliver, is when a student has a symptom, are they able to then, of course they have to go home, we, we've known that from the guidance. We've been operating under the uh, you know, rules that that child would be able to go with their family to the doctor, the doctor then could clear them and then send them back to school. One of the things that we need further clarification on from the IDPH is whether or not they are going to permit that or does that child have to be excluded for the entire 10 days? Because if that child has to be excluded for the entire 10 days, now we're in a homebound tutoring situation and, and, and it gets very, very complicated in terms of staffing. And also, it gets very complicated for that child and the classroom teacher about what does that work look like when that child is at home? Another thing that we're asking clarification on is if a child has a symptom or symptoms, are they going to require that siblings also stay home? Right now the guidance says no, but we need further clarification on that because obviously that could have a big impact on our instructional plan and quite frankly a recommendation that I may make to the board depending on that because you can see how that can quickly uh, balloon when you're talking about seasonal allergies, when you're talking about flu season, and so one of the things that we have to make sure of is that guidance is crystal clear so our nursing staff knows exactly what to do. And so we're hoping to get a lot of that clarified uh, this week. 
Remember, if you're a sibling and you have to stay home because of a close contact, that's not just a 10-day period. That is a 14-day period. And a negative test can't get you out of a quarantine because you can develop symptoms at any time during that period. So that's very important to us to know exactly what are the rules. And so we, we set up our plan based on the initial guidance. As you saw in the return to learn plan, there's a big draft up, uh, across that IDPH. Um, we're waiting for that final document to come to us because of course that could um, either solidify our plan or it could cause us to rethink some of our recommendations. And so just know that we are closely monitoring all of that. Another thing that we're working with the DuPage County Health Department on, so it's a very common question that I get from members of the community and quite frankly, every superintendent is getting this question. What is the metric you are going by to determine when a school or a district will close? And what I continue to share with people is the metric that we're going by is the guidance from the Illinois Department of Public Health and the DuPage County Health Department. We do not have a separate set of metrics for District 58. Why not? Because I am not qualified to develop such a, uh, a metric. We've seen school districts throughout DuPage County and the state really wrestle with, it, with this decision about what is safe, what isn't safe. We need crystal clear guidance from the DuPage County Health Department. And so the DuPage County Health Department on our call today is working on what that metric will look like and we are pushing very hard as superintendents because our community deserves that information. We all want that information because it will really help us as we start to talk about our school planning process. So we are certainly seeking guidance on that which we hope to have uh, within the next week. And, and so again, knowing that our school district doesn't start until September 1st is a bit of a relief, but also putting my parent hat on. You know, the closer we get to the start of school year, people really want these definitive answers. I can tell you as your superintendent, I want these definitive answers. And we are pushing very, very hard to get them. Uh, sometimes when you're dealing with Springfield, it can be extremely challenging as we all know, but nevertheless, we are continuing to push, push, push because we want that information. Okay, so moving forward, I'm not <clears throat> changing our recommendation as an administration right now um, because really the guidance hasn't changed since the last time I saw you, right? We are seeking clarification um, and we are in constant communication uh, not only with uh, the DuPage County superintendents but also the DuPage County Health Department. I've said it and I'll say it many, many times. I am so impressed with the County Health Department and just how quickly they get back to us. Uh, we are in, again, constant communication. We're also monitoring what our neighboring districts are doing. And so I wanna share a, a, a data point I got from the ROE. 44 districts in DuPage, now there's a few extra in there because remember even the, the ROE offers the on-site instruction for things like Partners for Success for the Behavioral uh, Program. 13 of the 44 are going full remote. The remainder of the districts have some form of on-site instruction, whether that's fully in person, whether that's a blended approach, whether it's a half-day approach, uh, you know, kind of like what we're doing as a school district. I think that's important to know because I have gotten a lot of communications about why are we the only district in DuPage County that is still open. Um, I, I really want to hit this number because, as you can see, we are not the only district in DuPage County. In fact, about 70% of districts in DuPage County are still open. You have seen some of the bigger districts like 203 or 204, you don't go fully remote, but the majority of districts in DuPage County are still opening for some form of on-site instruction. I, th I think that, or that number is extremely important. In our own world, in District 99, where are we at as a consortium of districts? Every district with the exception of Woodridge 68 is opening for some kind of on-site instruction in our 99 cohort group. And so I think that's important to know too, know that we are in constant communication with our group of superintendents as well, and with the 86 uh, group of superintendents because we think it's important to really regionalize this uh, you know, in conjunction with what we're doing across the county. I always say this, um, I am not an epidemiologist nor am I a medical doctor. So I am committed to seeking further guidance, clarification every time something comes up because obviously that could have an impact on a recommendation. Uh, new information is constantly coming out. You look at the data some days, it looks really good. Other days, it does not look very good, right? That's why we're seeking those metrics from the county. Uh, again, actively seeking that clarification. Flexibility is key. And I also wanna point out that we may be forced to pivot 
one way or another depending on that guidance. So as a board of education, we may have to do that at the next regularly scheduled meeting. I may have to call the board president and say, look, we just got all this new information and, and we need to have an emergency meeting or a special meeting. So know that I am committed as your superintendent to providing the board with uh, information and our community with information as it becomes readily available. There's a lot of talk out there right now, but nothing has fundamentally changed in the guidance. And we'll see what this week brings us. Um, it, it may bring us completely new information or it may just solidify our plans as written. So that is our last slide. And what I'd like to do now is if the board has any questions, we'll kind of spread out and, and go to different microphones here so we can answer those for the Board of Education. But that's our update on where we're at right now. Thank you, Dr. Russell, and to the entire administrative staff. I, I gotta say, while it's not crystal clear yet, and I don't know that it's ever gonna be even when we, when we start back, every week as we get updates from you, the clarity is improving and um, I know there's some real hustling going on, so I, I really, really appreciate that. Um, I just want to open it up to the floor now to if there's any discussion to be had or any um, particular questions uh, to go on as well. And just as a reminder, I'm going to keep this on the ongoing agenda, even though the 24th was technically our budget workshop. That is going to be a special meeting and because uh, we're going to have some action to take in that meeting anyway, and I will continue to have an opportunity for this discussion and this will go on continuing as well throughout the school year so that we have a lot of opportunities uh, to talk so but with that I'll open the floor I, I have a question if people don't mind me going first I guess uh, now that we have more firm enrollment numbers you know we don't have completely firm enrollment numbers the the topic of just equity and you know the choices you know I think that's a uh, topic that a lot of parents are struggling with um, you know every single day I guess I was hoping to kind of get the perspective from you Kevin um, James and Justin I was actually kind of hoping to get all three um, folks commenting on the topic of equity yeah I'll, so I'll start but I certainly want uh, James and, and Justin to weigh in um, there is a perception out in, in the community that um, the online Academy is somehow less of a choice than what you would get um, on site and, and I think some of that can, can definitely come from all of our bias, right? Uh, I, I believe that people fundamentally always feel like an on-site model is a better model, but I am uh, committed, and so is our team, to making sure that these two models are as equitable as, as possible. I think some of this also comes from, you know, before the state made an online program a requirement, um, if parents didn't feel comfortable, we had thrown out a marker that we wanted to have a consistent framework to start with and, and that's where we had a sell us learning and we were always committed to building on that. I do think though by throwing that online marker out there some of our parents um, feel like that's all that we're offering and, and so I have fielded many questions about no there is a synchronous component to it and you still will be able to have accelerated math so a piece of it is that still uh, but you know one of the nice things now that we have our staffing numbers is we can now look at class sizes and continue to try and make those as equitable as possible because we are hearing why is the online you know so much more than the um, on-site part of that is because of social distancing requirements right we can only fit a certain number of desks in each classroom when you have to uh, you know space them six feet apart and so we, we are getting some pushback about how come the classes online are bigger than what you would see on site a lot of that is just simply because of social distancing. But we're not looking to create our online classes to be any larger than what you typically would see in District 58. So those are just some, some general introductions to that, but certainly I'll, I'll turn it over to Justin and uh, James to offer a little bit more insight. Thanks, Kevin. I, I would echo the point about class size in that I think that our target would be that our online academy class sizes wouldn't be any larger than typical on-site District 58 class sizes. I think, again, to Kevin's point, we're probably not going to see 14s in the online academy like we might in some on-site classrooms. But I think that number of 30 that was thrown out initially in, in, in some of the very first communication is, is higher than we would want to be. And I think that's the work over the next few days that we're definitely going to try to accomplish. I think the other commitment is that you know, we are working particularly with, with math and reading and writing and SEL to ensure that we're aligned with the same resources, with the access to the same uh, physical print materials that we would be using on site as well for those students <coughs> in the online academy so that there is instructional equity. 
The other thing that I've said to every parent I've talked to about this particular program is that we've been very careful not to overpromise at any point in our communication because the worst thing we would want is for someone to become comfortable with a decision they've made for their family and then feel as if the rug was pulled out from under them. So to that point, as Kevin alluded, we began with we can guarantee a cellist. And then we moved to, we can guarantee that two and a half hours of synchronous instruction and taught by a District 58 staff member and then, or by, by a teacher I should say, and then additional monitoring of a cellist and other pieces by a District 58 staff member. As we continue to move through the coming weeks, it's our goal to do as much as we can to, to build onto that synchronous model. But there is also the reality that at some point there, the, the resources we have are finite. And so as we look at staffing all of these models, we'll be making decisions just as we do in a typical on-site year. We know that when we opened for the fall of last school year, we had class sizes of 18 and 19, and we had class sizes of 27 and 28. And that's a continuing struggle in, in any model that we're going to work through. And I think that we have the, the precedent and the history of working through it thoughtfully and meaningfully and being able to talk through the decisions that have been made. So I think that those are our next steps to really ensure that we're using the same principles and decision making when we think about class composition and instruction that we would in any other scenario. I also want to highlight um, one of the things we heard a lot during remote learning is, you know, why can't my child just get Zoom to for, for five or six hours? Um, I want to be very clear with the public that even when we're fully on site, that is not best instructional practice. Uh, we, we don't just sit in, in, in lecture to children all day long, especially, I think that makes sense to many of us who have younger kids. We know that that model uh, doesn't work. And, and so what I want to assure people who, who have picked the online academy, their teachers for on-site are, are not just doing straight talking to kids for the entire time, right? It, it's, it's a little bit of synchronous and asynchronous even on-site as it would be um, off-site as well. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I really appreciate the, the perspective and kind of looking backwards and, and not over promising. I appreciate it. But I think you have a commitment, um, you know, not only from, from you as a board, but from us as an administration. Um, every child is the District 58 student, and they all deserve the very best that, that we can do. And I can assure you that, that the planning team, that is exactly what we're striving for and continuing to look at it, continuing to take feedback from our parents and our teachers and our support staff and trying to make this better and better as the days go on. Thank you. In, in um, kind of piggybacking on what Steve was talking about, um, I've talked to a lot of parents and I know the last 24 hours for pretty much every family in Downers Grove have been agonizing, um, trying to decide what to do. Um, so as far as the online academy, you know, it started out with it's talking about Acellus and it was ramped up with the two and a half hours of the um, synchronous with a teacher using bridges and benchmark and stuff. What protocols or safeguards do we have um, for the online academy kids to, to like to say that, you know, we talked about the equity piece, but that at the end of the year, the kid kiddos that were online kind of are in the same place as the kids that were um, in person as far as like because we are using a cellist for science or social studies or maybe social studies or whatever um, you said that it's monitored by a district 58 staff is there like touch points like okay um, Jimmy you're falling behind you need to pick like are there same reper uh, repercussions for falling like not doing your assignments and stuff do you understand what that's I, I, I do I, I think what you're asking for and I'm gonna let Justin jump in here in a second is about how are we assessing students and there's two ways to assess our students we've got formative assessments so, which is what you know to me where, where really the rubber meets the road that teacher in front of the students assessing them informally you know whether that's through questioning or whether that's through uh, looking at work and and really then adjusting the instruction to make sure that they don't fall behind. So I think our first biggest safeguard with that is the quality of teachers that we have in District 58. Whether you're on site or whether you're in an online virtual academy is we have District 58 teachers working in both models. Our teachers are really, really good at making sure that kids are staying in track with the curriculum or excuse me, on track with the curriculum, uh, providing formative assessments, providing that feedback um, in through two and a half hours of synchronous instruction uh, required now with any type of remote learning. I think that goes a long way to making sure that our kids uh, stay on track. But I'll let Justin uh, jump in and further elaborate. 
Thanks, Kevin. I mean, again, one of the pieces that we that I briefly spoke to with these curriculum development groups is we really are working to make sure that that same instructional scope and sequence, those same essential standards that are being defined, will be implemented across the environments. Because in any environment, as, as I've said many times before, we still don't have the same amount of instructional time that we would. And even if we were fully on site for the same length of school day for, by, by some you know, happenstance in, later in the year, with this phase four guidance, those transitions would still take away instructional time. They'd be because of the, the additional hygiene, because of the additional components that we have to put in place. So similar to what we did in the spring, we're making those conscious decisions to ensure that there is a consistent scope and sequence. But to go one further, let, let's assume that we are not able to accomplish synchronous instruction led by a District 58 teacher for science, let's say. And so science is delivered exclusively by a cellus. This goes back to one of the reasons that we were, or a couple of the reasons that we selected a cellus in the first place. The, the first is that what we can guarantee is that the content is aligned to the Illinois learning standards and to the national standards in the case of science. And so we know that the content is being delivered consistently to all of those students. Is the delivery exactly the same as it would be by a District 58 teacher? Absolutely not. That is, that is one, of the, one of the gives in that scenario, but the, but the content and, and the core of the instruction is not sacrificed whatsoever. Acellus also has an assessment component that is interactive and, and responsive, similar to like the way a map assessment works. The technology is not exactly the same, but that's something that our community is familiar with, where if a student is answering incorrectly during those interactive activities after a lesson, the program will first remediate in digitally without even asking for a teacher. It will adjust those questions and, and try to target some of the skills that would be missing. A teacher is able to monitor that, ask a student to repeat a lesson, or on the other extreme, to move a little bit further forward if we need to do that. At a certain point where a student is not successful, then the teacher is alerted, and that staff member is definitely then providing that direct intervention. We're going a step ahead of that with the more consistent monitoring and making sure that we're seeing the kind of progress we would expect from students. So even in a scenario where we weren't able to accomplish one subject area for part of the year or some of the year, we still know that the standards aligned content is being delivered fully what we would expect in a year. In fact, in, in some ways you could argue there may be more science and social studies instruction in the online academy delivered directly than there might be based on the weekly minutes because we embed some of that nonfiction reading for science and social studies within our reading and language arts block, for example. So there, there's certainly, you know, again, that's where equity isn't going to be exactly equal, but we definitely can, we have, fail, we have safeguards in place to ensure that even if a student were to receive a cellist completely, it does align with the standards and does get them through. But it, it's not, just to take it further, it's not like a set it and forget it situation that it'll be monitored by, and, and a, a teacher will be following along and making sure that kids aren't falling behind or not doing the work. It's that not is, like, you yes. would have the direct interaction with somebody saying, hey, you need to make, finish this assignment or you, you need to go back and review it or whatever. Absolutely. And to be fair, a cellist could be a set it and forget it type of program. It's actually marketed that way in some in some ways. We are we are going above and beyond that by having the, the specific staff monitor. Um, the other question I, I have a couple and they're kinda all over the place. Okay. So um, the other question I had was if you could flesh out a little bit, I, I know this is hard because you're it's in the process right now, but um, a lot of people uh, we're asking, or that I've spoken to, about kind of understanding what the synchronous part of the online academy is. Um, I don't know if you could just briefly, you know, when you send, when you make the choice to go on site, you know that between 8.50 and, you know, 1 o'clock, they're going to be doing math reading, you know, like a regular day. Like, people know what it's like when you, you kind of know what the, it looks like when you put, send your kids to school. When it's an online thing, they're trying to flush out what that looks like because none of us have done it before. Uh, absolutely, and I think what, and again, I, I think we'll know a little bit better and we're gonna get the group of teachers that are in the online academy, I think about it almost like a little school, and kind of developing that program, what it looks like and when we really know what those class sizes are going to be. But what we talked about, what we envision is during the synchronous time, uh, doing you know, SEL, which can mean a variety of different things. A SEL uh, could be inclusive of our mor a morning meeting, which is a component of, uh, uh, or a number corner, I should say, which is a component of Bridges, which is an SEL type activity where students are learning and, uh, and kind of going through some of that math fluency. Uh, so it's embedded in some of our curricular areas. And that, again, that morning meeting, getting students going. So one of the things we talked about was uh, really building relationships. We're going to have 
students that don't know each other. Uh, you know, one of the questions we've gotten a lot about is are we going to try to group students together by school? We will absolutely try. We'll also try to honor AM, PM preferences as much as possible uh, to try to have those connections. So, but in the absence of most of that, we want to build some connections. Um, we're also going to have, again, time for math and time for ELA. So what is it going to look like? I think we're going to try to replicate that on-site experience as much as possible. Uh, and, and I think what that might mean is we're going to try to, this is one instance where to be able to get as much as we can in the day, we might have that longer Zoom call that is the entire block. And some students might go into a breakout room and work on one thing in their small group. Some students might go on to another breakout room. So I, again, I, it, it's without oversimplifying it, I, I think we, we want to try to imagine what, what if you're going to teach uh, an ELA lesson on person, what would you do? What would your procedures be? I think we're going to try to replicate that using the technology as much as possible. I think in our, you know, again, to paint a difference in our remote learning program, we're going to try to break that up a little bit more because we're going to have the, the use of the full day for those 2.5 synchronous hours. Whereas we're, we are trying to compact that again, that whole idea of the economies of scale. And, and so, but I think it's something we're going to have to get feedback on and see how that goes. And I also think that experience might inform our, what our remote learning is able to look like in the future too. Because uh, to be honest, this is, this is our first time doing 2.5 hours of synchronous learning uh, remotely. Right, we didn't have that in the spring. So I, I think there is going to be a little bit of experimenting on what, uh, what is best for teachers and what is best for students. Uh, but I think having that time, it's something that we, we, we weren't able to do in the spring, so instruction looked really different. But I, I think imagine getting on the Zoom call, uh, you know, talking through the day with your students, talking through the plan, giving a mini lesson, and then having a breakout room where some students might go into a breakout room and they might be just having their microphones off and working independently on something. The students popping between, or the teachers popping into one room and then popping into the room and checking in, and then doing a a, a small group lesson with that group. Uh, for for math, it might be again teaching a mini lesson, then checking with small groups while they're doing independent practice. Or even it might be uh, you know imagine if students are all doing independent practice at the same time, they might all just turn their microphones off and they might be working on it. Uh, we could potentially use the chat feature if a student needs help, or they could raise their hand. Uh, and try to use have some one-on-one -on -one feedback opportunities. So I, I think it is going to be a matter of trying to leverage the technology, recognizing that 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 all you can do is try to replicate on-site learning. It, just by its very nature, the experience is going to be different, I, and, we, and we can't solve that. But I think um, I, I, you know. So I, I I don't know if that helps paint a picture a little bit better. But I, we we do imagine longer chunks being on the Zoom call, but not as 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 Dr. Russell would do, not the teacher talking on a Zoom call for for two and a half hours, because I don't think that's productive for anyone. Um, so does, it, does, that, yeah. does that help answer your question? Yes, that actually leads to the next, and you can oh. stay in the hot seat. Uh, Tracy, uh, can, uh, I, can I just piggyback anyway. on that for one yeah. second? Absolutely. One of the things I'd like to see coming back, because obviously this is brand new, like nobody's remote taught kids of this age bracket and tried to do this much synchronous learning and stuff like that. I would really like to make sure that we're, we're getting regular updates on how teachers are feeling out. I, I, I want to make sure we're reaching out to parents and that we're having opportunity to kind of look at some of those data points to find out what's working because I think that to make sure that we are delivering equity to everybody we just have to we have to make sure we're we're touching out and, and, and listening to as many voices as we can to say is this working are our teachers feel like they're being successful in the way that we're learning because if there's tools that we need to make sure are available to our our staff or training or items that are available to our families we just question. want to make sure that we do that what <laughs> that was my next okay sorry yeah i just I want to make sure while we're on the topic where we pushed the date the start date off to september 1st um and i'm sure a lot of the um the initial days when the teachers come back and and are starting to work um there's gonna be a lot of protocol and like talking about logistics like where the rubber hits the road of getting in the building but is there also built in time for professional development for teachers to because now this is this is not like an emergency uh, we close school on Friday and start on Monday and we figure it out on the fly is there opportunities for them to learn how to go in a private group or have these little breakout groups or um, like learning about seesaw and Google classroom and all that stuff um, not only for teachers but also for parents who have not used it. I know how to use them because my kids have been in the district for a while, but for like the newer parents that are like, what is Google Classroom or what is Seesaw? Like those are important things. Uh, is there a professional development built in for the teachers on, on that in those first couple days or is it? So, so yes, and so we have, uh, we have four days scheduled that first week and I think 
and then one day the next week. Uh, so Monday and Tuesday were the regular scheduled days. And we have some predefined activities that were kind of already uh, scheduled for that. And, and then we, we have really three additional days w with our staff that we're able to use. And so that's something we're, uh, we're, we're really excited to have. And so I, I know um, in the curriculum meetings, the uh, development meetings we've been having, that's one of the topics you know, that, that we're talking about. I know Justin and Jane and Jessica and, and, and I are, are all thinking about those things that we want to have on this list. And one of the things that we've talked about is preparing the, 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 the remote offsite online academy. You know, they all have great similarities, so we know their strategies. And I, and I have my list, you know, through our uh, working with our list of skills that we need to make sure teachers have professional development. We need to make sure they know how to, again, how they can digitally whiteboard uh, their lessons. I mean, not all of them necessarily did last year. We need to know how they can, yeah can have their iPad up and their MacBook up to go into two different breakout rooms and do that sort of thing. Uh, you know, we need to make sure they know how to uh, support opportunities for student to give a, students to have uh, asynchronous discussion via the digital platform. So I, I think we have a list, and it's a long list, and, and so there, there, there's, you know, I, I don't want to overpromise, but I think having those, th this would be near impossible without that extra time. I, I just, we, we wouldn't be able to accomplish it. Uh, our teachers need time, so I, I think we're really excited to be able to have those three days. It's just something to, to have that many days to start the school year. Uh, and we're going to need it this year for sure, but I think it's, it's a really great opportunity. So I think we're going to be very strategic in how we utilize those days and, and recognizing that some of it will be, uh, especially for the on-site teachers, considering how they're configuring their spaces. Uh, for the teachers that are doing online academy it, it exclusively, we'll really be able to focus on that time on the strategies to make, uh, to, to make it successful. Um, to, to briefly touch on the point that, uh, that Darren asked about, I, I definitely think you know, serving and getting feedback from teachers and students and, and, and parents and, and families is, is going to be you know, it's something we did a lot of in the spring. And I, I, I don't know that as a, as a district team we've talked about the exact structures we're going to use for gathering feedback, but, but I can assure you it's something that we'll talk about and something we'll be, we'll be committed to doing. So um, there will, it will be, it could potentially be like how it was in the spring where we, you periodically are asking mm -hmm. for feedback. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 think I don't want to get ahead of the team, but, but I, 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 I go ahead. Our initial conversations around this, you know, whenever you try something new, um, and, and let's face it, this is new for every single school district, I, I think we have to commit to um, not only our families, but for our staff, uh, you know, to allow them to take risks in their teaching, but, but then to gather feedback from not only our families, but also our teachers about how successful it's going. And if we need to pivot from time to time, I, I, I think we need to do that. And we demonstrated that in the spring, that, that that was something we can do. Just to piggyback off a, uh, a couple of things that James had talked about with professional development, we are still planning on continuing our uh, Monday professional development sessions as well for our teachers. I think one of the things, and, and our support staff, uh, one of the things we have to be cognizant of is you just can't give it to people at the beginning of the year and then assume that everyone has it and everyone's comfortable. It's this ongoing throughout the school year, how do we continue to um, provide that professional development? And, and so on the calendar, you'll see later, it will say while early release days have obviously been suspended for students, we're still continuing with our professional development sessions uh, for staff throughout the, the school year, whether we're um, in this modified schedule or whether we're uh, back to normal. Uh, the other thing too that we've intentionally left are two of these planning days. If you remember, the state gave us five. And we intentionally left two in the event we had to make a major pivot. I really hope that major pivot is getting everything back to normal and, and resuming everything, uh, but it could be a pivot to full remote learning. And in that, uh, you know, we have to provide professional development for that pivot as well. And so um, we, we have structured this to, to really think of those things, um, but professional development for staff it is so critical during this time because again this is no school district has done this um you know in, in the state of illinois really throughout the country thank you no, no, there was go ahead i'm sorry there's one part that i didn't answer your question that was the parent uh and caregiver oh. and family side of that so I, I appreciate you mentioning that again i think this goes all the way back to the superintendent advisory council this was something that 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 pre-covid was on our that <laughs> was actually on our radar to do a better job of this upcoming school year uh, supporting parents and using these technology tools and so I, I think we had some some really good feedback in that regard again you know pri prior to to, to to all the excitement we've had over the past six months and so now I think it's even more important so I, I you know I, I've been gathering some resources to try to support that uh, you know I think I'd like to have some more live Q&A type events and then recording those and making those available uh, and so I think really uh, absolutely I think we need to do a better job of supporting caregivers at home uh, for how they can support Seesaw, how they can support Google Classroom, how do they upload a video to Google Drive, how do, you know, like what do these tools mean? And even the basics of just uh, 
you know, we've done some of these in the past, but I think, I think getting back to it, the basics of, you know, how do you manage having, you know, uh, an iPad for each child in the house, and what are some of the basic things you can do, and what's, uh, how do you monitor what they're, you know, what's happening with YouTube and the filters, and how does all that work? So I, I, it is something that we're, you know, it's going to be a lot of work, and it's going to take a lot of time, but it's something that we're committed to, to doing uh, uh, throughout the course of the year. And I, and I also think it's something we, wanna, we do want to think about timing. I, I have to go back and look at our notes from Superintendent Advisory Council, but you know, when is the best time to get that stuff out there uh, and prepare parents to, to be ready for it? But the more, I, I know there's a lot of sweat equity involved for the administration on that, but ultimately, like, I think that would um, also, it doesn't, you don't think about it this way, but it will alleviate um, the pressure on teachers because I know that in the spring, the teachers were fielding a lot of questions and um, about technology and, and whatever, and if we could take some of that off of their plate <laughs> so that they can stick to Focus the on what, yeah, reading, absolutely. writing, so and arithmetic, that, that would be really important, I think. Just to jump in there, I do know um, that Kankakee School District is actually having, um, like, before school starts, um, school days for parents uh, to walk through everything what the day looks like how to log in how to do this how to do zoom how to do so it's I don't know how they're doing it specifically um, but I do know that even uh, at my job we've been doing a lot of where we have someone doing a zoom and you know showing themselves on Zoom and showing exactly what to do so that you can break off into groups or do whatever. Um, and I think if that there's some sort of parent hub that has all this material that they can actually um, watch or download or um, watch on YouTube, um, all those different things, because again, all parents do, le everyone learns differently. I like to still print out things because I, that I can't learn by watching someone using this. Um, and again, some of our parents, like myself, made it through college without touching an actual computer. So <laughs> having some of these <laughs> things is, I am the oldest one here, um, is that could be challenging for some of the parents um, that, you know, not everyone grew up with a cell phone. So just as a, you know, reminder that we kind of have to think of that maybe parents are all starting at square one as well um, and making sure that even basic stuff of where on your child's iPad do you turn it on um, just even stuff like that because there might be parents who don't know and if we do want them to be involved it's up to us to make sure that those resources and that training is available from us thank you I think the other thing that it's going to be challenging for all school districts this fall is that most of our parents who were maybe able to be off from work in the spring uh, because COVID w w was new and people were at home aren't going to have that same luxury in the fall um, and, and so how do we make it as user friendly and, and archive a lot of these things so our parents can have access to them at a later time because they may not have the same level of access that they had um, in the in the spring. In fact, I would I would say most people won't. Right. Sorry, Tracy. Go back to you. No, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, then I'm just going to jump in on my my other one. Um, it's just the so when the new schedule came out for the first through sixth graders, um, I did hear a lot of <laughs> chatter amongst um, the families. Um, I think it's just the concern of it's not that. It's the block of time, it's just where that block of time is landing. Um, even if we start at nine o'clock, it doesn't necessarily mean your child's gonna wake up three hours later because if you still are leaving the house to go to work at seven, your child's still gonna wake up at 6.30, eat, and all the kids are used to 11.30-ish lunch, mm -hmm. and that one, you know, by the time they get home, it could be 1.30, quarter to two, and the littles are gonna have a, hard time if I am in meetings and I'm not eating I turn into not the best person to work with so <laughs> I can just imagine you know we're already um, making it as difficult um, you know with lots of other things that are going to make it difficult to teach that just a, a child's hunger or if there is a child that doesn't eat breakfast 
Um, maybe they're picky, maybe that's just not how they work, or maybe their family doesn't have the option of providing them breakfast. Um, that's a long time to wait. Um, and so I am concerned about that. I know that we do have snack time built in, but um, we are used to that 11.30, um, again, ish time of, of having a full meal. Um, and just if there are ways to address that and to help your child work with a change in time, if there's, um, again, in a parent hub where they could go on and, and hear from a family therapist or a behavioral specialist that can help you kind of get your child through what some of these changes and uh, adaptions that they may need to make. Um, because if it isn't a medical reason why if they maybe need to have medication at a certain time with food, I know that that will not change um, in the school and that we will have a snack time. But um, I do think that there's going to be, you know, it's going to take a while. And I do think that this, that's a long, a two hour time difference is, is a long time. And f for an adult or even mm -hmm. my child who's going into seventh grade, you know, you'll be fine. You'll eat later. And she's like, okay. Um, but for the, the younger kids, I think that could be a very detrimental piece. Um, and I know that we're really struggling with the transportation. Um, but again, just because we're starting later doesn't mean their day is starting any later. And I do think that, um, I know you haven't not thought about it, uh, but just to continue to keep that. Yeah, I know, Jill, I, I really appreciate that because I, you know, again, all cards on the table. I think that's something that's concerning all of us. Um, and, um, you know, that, that afternoon time when those buses can get to school, I think that was all, it was kind of a gut punch to us when, when we saw those times and when we were able to, to do that. So um, we will certainly commit to continuing to, to look at that because um, I, I have young kids myself. And, and uh, I think what you said is probably true of all of us, uh, especially our, our younger students. When, when they start the school year two, it usually is a, is a bigger issue as they get more accustomed to it throughout the, the year. So um, really communicating with our families and, and, and trying as best we can to push that lunch back. One of the other things we're looking at for, um, Todd and I have briefly talked about this for our free and reduced students, is there a way to send them home the night before with a meal that they, they could then have in the morning before they came to school? We, we had a lot of experience with that this uh, summer where we would give, you know, basically a package of meals on that Thursday that people could have over the next several days. So we're certainly looking at that. Uh, Todd and Katie have done a great job with, with food and, and making sure that those who are hungry um, do have access to that food. Great. So uh, I'd love to, just, because we're on that uh, topic, I'd love to ask a question about it. Do you mind just helping us understand a bit more about the transportation constraints and coordinating with 99? Yeah, I'll let uh, Justin and, and uh, Katie and Todd hop in there as well to talk about that coordination. Um, Todd and, and uh, Justin obviously lead in this area with the instructional minutes and then uh, with coordination of 99. But go ahead, Justin. Sure, thanks. Yeah, we, we once we had, you know, once plans have been, been established, we and obviously, you know, the 99 situation had been fluid, but they did propose and the schedule that they are currently with in terms of their hybrid schedule uh, a little while ago. And so, their dismissal time is, I believe, 1220 for their on-site instruction. And so as we sat down on a call with the 99 folks and our first, the first student folks and, and us, we really worked through every possible scenario that might be out there. Um, we looked carefully at the number of buses that are actually shared. There are certainly still, you know, there are still conversations to be had. And, you know, there, we, we really tried to think about how can we accomplish this. One of the pieces of feedback we got early on was we wanted our middle school day to end a little bit before our elementary school day because there was the sense that for many families having that middle school student be home first on those days would be a benefit. That may or may not be true, but it was part of the decision making factor which is why the middle school schedule stayed closer to where it is and the elementary schedule shifted down that, that 20, 25 minutes or so to be able to accomplish the busing. So it really had to do with how many buses are actually shared with routes. And you know, Todd and Katie may be able to speak a little further. There was conversation about potentially some route consolidation, but that doesn't always help because that can just make routes longer, and so it, it, it may not actually solve our problems. In, in short, uh, we have a contract that we work together with um, Woodridge, uh, ourselves, and District 99, uh, that they run a two-tier system to keep those rates down, uh, and the rates are 
adjusted and, and bid out um, based on that model. Um, they uh, require almost or all of our buses and most of Woodridge buses to run the District 99 routes. So therefore, you know, we have to we have to live within the constraints. You know, the, and this is not unusual for any type of system that has a a one two or a two tier or a three tier structure, mm -hmm. uh, whether you're a unit district or in this case, um, you know, combined districts that we're doing this with. So, um, so we have. You know, and the reality is, the high school is the largest routes and the largest number of buses, and therefore. You know, that structure goes in there um, with this adjustment of time uh, that everyone's doing to, to get to a modified structure that's been putting the, some constraints into all of that. And so, you know, we're pushing again, like everything, you know, to get it to work right uh, as close as we can and make, you know, make it, make it happen uh, so we can get the kids out in and out as quickly as we can. I'd love to understand a bit more about uh, order of operations there. Uh, our students are uh, four-year-olds to 13-year-olds um, and it sounds like we're deferring to the 99 hours schedule where their students are 14-year-olds to 18. Um, I, as a 58 board member, I'm going to advocate for our students. Is there a way for us to have priority preference on routes and times and have the high school shift according to what our needs are? It, it's more about the number of buses that's required to run. I mean, if we if they didn't need 100% of our buses, then obviously that could work. Um, and the, the and the high school did make adjustments in, you know, in their structure and in their routing system so that we could get in, you know, to our framework. But you know, the the the, the reality is there's you know so much time between each route and so you know and, and the routes are are x long. Um, and as of right now today, you know, the requirement for what the bus load is for both districts based on, you know, the population, it kind of, it, it really puts a constraint on what's available for buses and for drivers. The other piece is we have limitations not just on buses, but people to drive them. Um, and that is not, um, that, and that is always an issue. And, and this is the challenge as well, um, you know, because we also have contractual obligations in terms of when our staff reports to work. Um, I, Crop, we're right there with you. I, I, I echoed some of the same things as we were going through this process. Um, we can commit to, to continuing to look at this to see if we can problem solve. Um, I don't think any of us are wild about the, the, the schedule that, that's in front of us. Um, it, it, it's that tricky balance between when do you get the buses, when is your staff arriving, how do you get the kids in staggered, all, all of those other things. Um, would I love to see it align more with what we're used to? Absolutely, 100%. So, but I, I, and I'm not suggesting you know anyone saying this up at the board table. We will continue to advocate for our our, our students. Um, the reality is, with our tiered structure, though, it, it, it becomes challenging because you're relying on so many different X factors. You're relying on so many different collective bargaining agreements about when staff members are are in and out. Um, but we can continue to work on this. Um, you know, one of the things too is as you look at routes as you as you put kids in seats there, there could be more wiggle room I, I i can't commit to anything but i i i will commit that we're going to continue to look at this and, and see if we can make some improvements in this area because i know it's a concern uh, i i think every one of you have expressed that to me in one-on-one -on -one conversations and um, certainly i know it, our parents are feeling that as well correct there's something i i because i've had several conversations about this um and i i I think one of the things that helped me understand a little bit is, is why the balance remains the way that it is, is there's 99 that uses a ton of buses and then the feeder districts sort of share in those buses. So it, it, it's different. it would be different if we were the only feeder district in the 99 and then we could sort of negotiate with them. But it's like we're one piece of the, the secondary pie. And so when we go to negotiate as a, as a whole, they're obviously the big piece of the pie. And, then, and we could, that helps us save a lot of money. You know, um, we don't have the advantage of like say center cast who has their own school buses, just, uh, you know, owned by the district and, and, and things like that. So, um, 
because I'm with you. Like I looked at this and I said, we got, we got the little ones here. We got to, what can we do to fix this problem? And, and I'm looking at it from every perspective. And, and maybe my, my vision is skewed a little bit because my kids attending Lester, our kids already eat lunch in the classroom. So I've seen that work as young as kindergarten with the kids eating in the room. And so like I'm going, you know, my head is going every which way. What can we do? Like is, you know, can we make, should we make the dismissal? What's our latest earlier time that we can get to be before them? You know, like that was going through my head. And can we get back to an 815 start? Um, do we need to try to expedite and get to full day where we're feeding kids? And can we get to a place quicker than, than October 26 where we're comfortable feeding these kids in the classroom? Because we've got, you know, can, can we try to expedite that and look where it's been successful and then and try to do that? Because I, you know, I worry about the 850 start from a parent perspective. I think that's a challenge alone. But Jill hit the nail on the head when she said, if your workday starts at 7 and you're getting these kids in, Champions Opens at 7 a.m., or Link or any of these programs, you know, if that's where their kids are, are leaving the house, one, 110 is, is a, a, a long time to go. I mean, it, you know, there, I think there's probably several members of the board that would say that that's too long of a, a, a period for us before we start getting hangry. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, it's, I think that while we may not have a perfect answer on this, this is one of those things that if we can continue to explore ways um, to try to correct, we, and there might not be a good answer, but I, I'd really like to, to see that. And, and if we go this route, I think it's something that we've got to get feedback on, you know, even from the classroom, you know, how big of a challenge is, is this? Should we try to, try to get to that two o'clock period quicker? Should we just, you know, can, if that first week goes well, can we start pushing for a little bit bigger snack? You know, like, you know, hey, parents, send a little bit more robust snack to school, because almost like a mini lunch, but not, you know, quite, what is our best approach to, to make sure that the kids can be successful in, in that room? Because um, I don't see a perfect answer here, and that's why I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I, I, I share the, no, the same and, concerns and, that you have. And we certainly yeah. recognize that, and we, we see it too. And, mm -hmm. and so the more we can continue to look at this, I, I, I can't commit, like I said, to any magical answers right now. It, it, it's how do we continue to look at this? Are there efficiencies that we can identify with 99? And, and tweak this a little bit on, uh, on both ends. Um, I thought you, you said it very well about what's that earliest, latest time. And, and, and you know, I also recognize that you know, most people's workplaces don't start at 9.30, right? And, and so that's another challenge that, that we're really trying to figure out as we go through this. And uh, we will continue to look at this and, 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 and try and find those efficiencies because I know it's a concern. It, it's a concern that, that I'm hearing from parents, all of our board members. and you know, in, in, in all of us as well. How can we make this a little bit better? So I guess, how do we take that to the next step then? Like, it, is it like, you know, right now, I guess we're all not happy with the reality, <laughs> right? Um, is it just, you know, we're gonna continue to have conversations uh, with 99 and, and first student, I, I guess, is this just kind of being transparent to the reality and kind of putting an FAQ for community? Because I think, you know, that 850 was a kind of punch in the face for a lot of the parents. Uh -huh. It, not even taking the kids into account, I think. So I think one thing we could potentially do is just kind of be a little bit more transparent in the thought process that that went behind um, the current decision mm -hmm. and maybe putting that in the FAQ. I mean, that would make me feel a little bit better. Yeah, no, I, I think and that was one of the reasons we wanted to have this conversation here tonight with the Board of Education is so our public can see but, but again, recognizing that not everybody, uh, you know, will watch the board meeting, and uh, nor should they. Um, I, I think that's the first step, Steve, is pointing that out. Here's the why behind this decision. I know not everybody loves it, um, and rightfully so. But uh, you know, here's why we made this decision. Here are the ongoing conversations uh, that that we're having to try and um, you know make that better. To, to answer your question, what are the next steps? As you continue to dialogue with our partner district, you continue to. Uh, dialogue with the transportation company and see if there are any more uh, uh, efficiencies. I, I can tell you, especially around that 110 number, that was not the first number that was thrown out to us. <laughs> uh, and, um, you, you know, I, I'm looking at Katie here. Uh, we, we, we are continuing to have these conversations, continuing to try and get better. Um, but again, time is of the essence here because the school year is starting. I don't think it's a big deal to move that start time. I, I shouldn't say it's not a big deal. Moving the start time up, 
I think you, you can accomplish that. You've got to be careful with kindergarten times and preschool times and in, in all these things and contractual times and how long it takes kids to get in the buildings with all these enhanced safety measures. Um, but getting those buses back from District 99 in order to do our route, that's the biggest challenge here uh, that, that we're up against. And um, how we can figure that out or, or, or you know, work with first student, um, we will continue to dialogue with them to try and get that better. Okay. And then would, we'll report back as we give updates. And Kevin, just to add, I think Jill made a really good point in terms of in the meantime, we're going to work with our, our families to make sure everyone's aware of those distances. And I think we're with some of our, our, our child care partners. You know, if someone's arriving at 7 and then they're going to be there an hour and a half, perhaps there's an opportunity for a morning snack there, which could help to bridge some of that gap. So I think there are, you know, to the, to the point of education and thinking through how can we, how can we make this as workable as possible for our students. There's, there are options there as well. Can I ask a quick question? I know um, there's been a little bit of talk about um, staggering arrival and departure times at given buildings, um, with buses arriving perhaps earlier than walkers or drivers, and the same thing at, at dismissal time. Are those going to be decisions made at the building level, at building specific to each individual school, depending on how their arrival and departure procedures are going to run, and when will that information be communicated to parents, and will that come from the district, will it come from the principal? It's like I've had a lot of questions from parents um, along those lines. Like I, I, they, there's definitely concern about the, the times, but I think more so they just need to start planning. And so mm -hmm. if they're like, when can I drop my kid off? What's the actual time? What's that going to look like? How am I going to know? How is that all gonna go? Um, so the answer is the system itself comes from the district, right? Are we gonna have cars and walkers arrive first and then buses second, right? Um, so that is something now that we have our numbers, we can start looking at and saying, okay, when exactly are the buses gonna get there? And then you determine whether it makes sense to have the buses arrive first and then the walkers second. We are definitely advocating for a two-tier approach because we wanna reduce the number of kids coming at, at, at once. Um, I have a lot of experience with this as a parent uh, when my kids were at one of their schools that this is how we did it for years it, it worked out very very well um, in that particular case buses always were second everybody else was was first on the front end and the back end how that gets communicated though will certainly be something from the building level because the building are they're going to be the ones who are telling you okay you've got a first grader a Pierce Downer you're going to be using door number one here's a picture of the door you know our principals are working on videos to to explain all of this stuff so all of the communication comes from the building. The parameters are set by us at the district, and, and, and that's the work over the next uh, several days now that we know our numbers. But we all have a desire to avoid mass gatherings mm -hmm. a, a, as people are coming in and to adhere to that social distance because one of the things that our plan hinges on, and I, again, I want to be very, very upfront with our community, is this plan is only as good as people are willing to put the things into practice. If people are not willing to put the things into practice, we cannot have on-site instruction. And so how we set this up for success really makes a difference. How we educate people and get them in the right doors and making sure that we don't line up is so very important. Dr. Russell, you uh, mentioned a um, public health guidance continues to come in. Um, and your, your approach to date, I think, just has been super comprehensive. And the things you've been asking for and pushing for, I think, are the right things to be asking for and pushing for. You alluded to a potential shift in recommendation if you get more information in a certain direction. And I, I imagine uh, none of us are prophets to be able to expect what we can expect from the Department of Health. But is there something that you're looking for in terms of guidance from the health department on here's if, if they said x my recommendation was shift to y or um if if we hear something like this here's how that would impact our recommendation do you have that level of clarity right now that you you're comfortable like sharing knowing that you don't know what to expect from the department of health yet yeah so one of the things that i am very concerned about it is we look at this and, and i think every superintendent would be concerned about this is what are the exclusionary requirements for uh students who are showing symptoms or staff members who are showing symptoms um, is that a full 10 days does that mean that the person has to go to the doctor and even if they go to the doctor can they only get cleared with a negative test 
Now that is very extreme. Right now they're telling us, no, the person can just go to the doctor, they can, you know, the doctor can excuse them back in, so to speak. Like right. I use my, my daughter all the time who's going in seventh grade has severe seasonal allergies. The, the kiddo sneezes from August until uh, the, the first frost, right? Um, now I understand that if she's showing symptoms, she would then have to go to her doctor. And if the doctor can then write the note back, you're, you're talking maybe a one or two day absence. If we get in a situation now where all of a sudden they're coming back and saying, no, we're going to take an extremely conservative approach where that kid's out for 10 days and even with the doctor's note, they have to go get tested. And if testing isn't readily available, that creates a situation that we really have to talk about as a school board because now you're into homebound tutoring and things like that. I want to be clear, that's not where the guidance is right now. The guidance is saying that um, you can get an alternate clinical diagnosis and, and, and you, know, you can come back to school. So that's something uh, that I am looking at. And then I'll, I'll go one further with that. If siblings then have to be excluded in that model, now you're talking 14 days for a close contact. And in a 14-day exclusionary model like that, you can't test out of that, right? Because you can develop those symptoms anytime in 14 days. So that potentially is, is something that I'm looking at for guidance that would cause me to really come back to the board and say, you know, we, we wouldn't have enough homebound tutors or, or, you know, you're talking about the instructional time that we're missing across the board. Um, because then I think you get up a situation where parents would go, well, perhaps it's better for me to just be in this online academy because it's more consistent than what we could get, uh, you know, on site. And so, again, that's the extreme that I'm painting, but, but that's one measure that I'm looking for in terms of exclusionary requirements that, that I'm trying to get very specific answers to because our nurses are asking for that and so are our building leaders. What are we doing when these things happen? We have general parameters right now, but I'm looking for more specifics than that. Um, in terms of some of the other health metrics, I don't have the expertise that, that an epidemiologist would have, um, but things that are being discussed are availability of testing, um, positivity rate, cases per 100,000, uh, inside DuPage County compared to the other regions, uh, you know, those types of things. And so what we're really looking for from the county is what metric can we all then comfortably go back to our community and say, this is what we're all working under as a county. So I'm looking for that specific measurement. Now, of course, if we're already at that measurement, well, then I have to immediately change my recommendation. Um, so for instance, they said the positivity rate can only be 3.5%. By the way, they haven't said any numbers or anything like that. So I'm, I'm, that's just for sake of argument right now. And the positivity rate is right now hovering at 4.1 then we would immediately have to shift into remote learning. And so having that defined number versus just saying the community, um, you know, we're gonna take whatever recommendation we get from the DuPage County Health Department, which is where we're at right now in the guidance. That's another thing that I'm looking for a superintendent to really get that clarity. And, and that's not just me talking, that's Dr. Feely from 99. Hank and I talk daily uh, about these things and what we're looking for, um, you know, as two superintendents that share so many families we're looking for that same set of criteria. Appreciate that. Uh, you may have chosen not to share this because you don't know what the guidance is given for the health department, but in the event that it does come to that extreme level of 14 day quarantine or 10 days at home, regardless of doctor note, what does that mean in terms of the recommendation? And what should, I guess, what, should, what could families be prepared for in terms of the threshold on what you as a superintendent would be comfortable in terms of recommending to us so that we all kind of know what to expect when we start to hear more and more clarity from the health department. And I'm gonna give you an out because I think it's appropriate and unfair to put you on the spot in this way. Yeah. If you feel like I don't know what the health department is going to say and so I can't say what the recommendation would shift would be, I think that's a perfectly fair answer rather than giving guidance that otherwise might not be factual. So I, I am gonna take that out, not, not just for the sake of taking the out. One of the things that um, Jessica Stewart and I were looking at, we're, we're looking at you know, let's take a couple of weeks in September and, and let's say we had this super exclusionary requirements. Let's look back to last year. Yeah. If we had those same super exclusionary requirements that, that I'm outlining to the extreme, what would that have done for us in a school district? So, so that's one thing that I'm looking at, right? Because we may look back and go, oh my gosh, if we were under these rules last year, you know, we could have 50 kids out or 50 staff out. Or we may look back and go, you know, this really was a minor impact and so we're working on, on, on some of those numbers um, and I can't say for clarity right now what my recommendation would be because I don't know what the final guidance is going to be right now if it stays the way it is I'm comfortable if maybe they 
say, you know what, you, you can go to the doctor and get signed out, but you don't have to do the 10-day exclusionary, I, I, you know, I could say I'm comfortable. If it's every kid and their siblings have to stay home, uh, that gives me pause. And then I'd really have to have some conversations with the health department behind their rationale. And, you know, what does that exactly mean? And if it, testing is another big thing, Karat, that I'm really concerned about, if testing is a requirement for any symptom, knowing the availability of testing, that, that's a concern. Appreciate that, thanks. Mm -hmm. I had a couple more questions, if there's any others. Well, you, you go ahead. Okay. Uh, Dr. Yusentis, I, I have a question about the remote learning contingency. I know that as the state continues to give us guidance, we have to prepare for the situation of full on-site and also for remote. Um, help, help us understand what staffing shifts you think we might need to be prepared for or what our staff might need to be prepared for in terms of shift of their roles in the event that we are moved to remote learning. What, what, what about what planning is happening now to prepare for that type of potential environment? Some of our conversations, meaning the ASC team, assistant superintendents, it really, there's two main models, if you will, um, and it, but it's still early, and so I'm being, trying to be very cautious to not, um, depending on when that shift happens, particularly if it's before the school year, yes, we could open, or we could, um, use a staffing plan similar to what we had at the end of last year versus we're in this phase four planning model which is the smaller class is 15 we could continue and, and go remote keeping that same configuration so those are the probably the biggest ones I think that we've really looked at it's really dependent on that trying to get a good sense of when that occurs you know we would still in our planning we still want to account for this happening after the school year started, but really it's the, okay, if, if this conversation is actually happening and this change happens before September 1st, what are the pros and cons of either one of those approaches? Mm -hmm. oh, and there will be pros and cons for, for either one of them. Is that enough? Does yeah, that that's helpful, correct? thank you. Um, okay question on the kindergarten iPads. I just know how important it's going to be for technology access for our earliest learners, and including all learners. What's our contingency plan in case those devices don't get delivered on time? So from a contingency plan perspective, I, I think it'd be a conversation with the teachers. We are fortunate that we do have we do have Chromebooks available, so if it, it came down to the point of, of um, is it worth having a device that's not particularly user friendly for a kindergartner, but it will help them get on a Zoom call. Uh, they can be on Seesaw, maybe not with a touch screen. You know, we, we do have um, a, a fair amount of those Dell Chromebooks. They're, they're, again, they're older devices. They're, they're, they're being um, yeah, they're, they're being turned in by our middle school students. And so I, I think that's an option we would explore. I think it would depend on timing and, and what it's looking like as to whether or not that's, uh, that's worth the effort and the shift. Um, and I, I think I would probably only recommend that if I knew it was going to be long term. I, I don't anticipate it's going to be long term. I, I can tell you the date that Apple is telling me that they're going to ship right now is August 18th. Um, so I, I think that will be tight if they ship Coming later that week, uh, as you recall, our, our plan is actually to turn around some staff devices because um, these new devices could go to staff and we'll give them the upgrade, upgrade uh, which again potentially gives them the opportunity to do some better digital inking. So there, there, there are some moving parts that make it complicated to turn around pretty quickly. Uh, I, I know this is one that's really important and so I, I'm, I'm not feeling great about it. I know we really want to have the students, those devices in students' hands right away so they can start acclimating as best they can. So I, it, we might have to make some some hard decisions on, on, on what's best and how to handle it, but um, those are some of the things that, that, we're, that we're thinking through. Um, does, does that help? Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if there's an option, and I know this is tough, but in, in the situation where, I know we went, we were going from two to one to one to one in essence, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, that, that shift, um, if there's an oppor opportunity or an option, I'm sure you're thinking through all the contingencies, but 
if there are families that have other devices at home that are available, do they pick up later when the shipment is available and make do in the meantime, uh, whereas families that need that device or don't have a device otherwise can move to the front of the line in essence. But uh, I'm sure you're thinking through contingencies and you don't have to respond to that, but just putting uh, that out there. And, and, and we, we did you know, de deploy that type of solution last spring and it was, it was very effective. And I, and I think our, our Downers, Growth, Growth, Downers Growth families has kind of stepped up as always. I, I think very, uh, I think there are families that I, that I almost wish would have asked for it, but they're really trying to be helpful to the greater cause and say, you know what, I can make it work. Um, so I, I definitely think we could do that. Uh, I, I think the, the more challenging piece of that is what happens in the classroom as opposed to, to, what, it, to what happens at home. If we're only focused on, on what was happening outside the classroom, I think that would be uh, a, a very simple thing to get a form out again and, and try to get those devices into the hands of the right students. But what I also have to compound that with, uh, with the learning that's going to be taking place on site. So, but but that, that is a great uh, that's a great point. It's something that we're we're thinking through. Thank you. You are welcome. Any other comments, questions? I have one thing, and and that's just for both the online academy, or or should we go into any kind of remote? We touched on this, I, I think, in a previous one, but I think I just want to reiterate the fact um, that the physical materials that we have. Um, the consumables, those would be made available and sent home. To, is that some of the stuff that we expect the kids to kind of carry back and forth and, and that we're going to use at home as opposed to having to print or try to read them on their screen? Yes. Uh, I, to re I mean, the very short answer is yes. Uh, and I think one of the things we talked about for a full remote scenario is uh, we talk about a lot is really making sure teachers are, 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 are ready to be able to quickly send those things home. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, if we all we all remember Friday the 13th in, uh, in March. Uh, and so that, that was a, a moment we we're trying to get things sent home as quickly as possible. Uh, so I, I think, you know, we even had a conversation today with some, you know, with some sixth grade teachers thinking about the novels that, that it may not be, you know, should we need to go full remote? Uh, uh, you might not think about just the next novel, but two novels ahead of the ones that you want to have in those backpacks, being able to send those home quickly. And, and then for online academy, again, to reiterate, uh, any material or resource that we have that we have on hand or have purchased for those students, you know, th those were all purchased. You know, again, the curriculum department has been working really hard on that all summer. So those those have been purchased for all of our students, and we absolutely want to make those available. Uh, you know, we, we want well, one of the pieces of feedback we heard a lot through the the task uh, forces and through other surveys is that we everyone understands there's a very strong digital component to any remote learning online academy off-site scenario, but, but, but it doesn't have to be sitting staring at a screen all, all day. There, there's a lot of that stuff that can be do on a piece of paper, take a picture, upload it to Seesaw. So uh, again, short answer, yes, and hopefully I provided some additional detail there as well. I, I don't know if Justin or Kevin has anything to add to that? No, th and thank you. And I just remember the debate coming up when we were buying the devices and everything else like that, really talking about how important some of these materials were. And I think that we heard from a lot of parents, and I know even in my own household, that um, I printed a lot because my kids just functioned better when I printed out the reading materials or even the worksheets. Um, and then, you know, all the annotation and stuff that they had to do when you're talking about a first grader or a, a third grader, it just, um, it, was a, it was a skill that I think they benefited from doing it physical. And I, now that we have time to prep, I just want to really think about what resources we want to make sure physically are in their hands. So um, thank you. I know that's, I know we kind of touched on it before. I just wanted to make sure it was still in, in our in our minds. Is there any uh, last minute uh, discussion items before we move on? Well, thank you everybody. A lot of good discussion there tonight. And thank you so much for the presentation. Obviously, I feel like every time we do this, we lay out a lot of questions for the next one, but we, we do truly appreciate the hard level of work that's been going into this. Uh, okay, it's now time to move on to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but is not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or, or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. Criticism of individuals is not in order. The board has allocated 30 minutes for public comment this evening. We ask that you keep your comments to a three minute limit to allow everyone the opportunity to speak. At this time, we've received two cards. We will ask that each person who has submitted a card to please come up to the podium, state your name and your attendance area, and then provide your public comment. In an effort to give everyone an opportunity to speak, if the substance of your comment mirrors previous comments, we ask that you keep your comment especially brief. 
After all those who have submitted a card have had a chance to speak, we will read those submitted remotely. In the event we run out of time to read all the remote comments allowed, please know that we will be publishing all comments submitted remotely on the agenda in board docs if you would like to refer to them after the meeting. Should there be any time remaining, we will then take any additional in-person comments. Okay, uh, first up, uh, Craig Young with the DGEEA. Good evening, thank you. Uh, here I am back again, Craig Young. I teach fourth grade at Kingsley and uh, serve as the president of the DGEEA. Uh, tonight I just want to spend a few minutes uh, providing some context for the concerns that the DGEA continues to have regarding our return to learn plan. Uh, and I've been thinking about this a whole lot, uh, as I'm sure you all have as well. Uh, basically, I feel like it, it really just boils down to this. The, the plan that administration uh, recommended and, and the board approved last meeting uh, looks great on paper, it looks great on a PowerPoint. Um, but teachers are just seriously concerned about how it will actually work in the building and, and whether or not we can make it work in our schools. Um, just as you know, some examples, we have a cleaning and sanitizing disinfecting plan, uh, but we don't yet have this staff to execute it. We still have two openings in uh, our custodial department. And I mean, we've got one week until our new teachers return, two weeks until all staff returns, and only three weeks until students return. So, there's a big concern there of, man, how are we going to get these buildings as clean as we know they need to be without uh, the fully staffed custodial department? Uh, the instructional plan, you know, it looks workable when we see it in these PowerPoints, but teachers are having trouble finding that adequate daycare, um, you know, having to take the, the leaves, as uh, Dr. Dennis had mentioned. Um, they're dealing with health concerns of their, their own, health concerns of their families. Um, causing them to take leaves, uh, possibly even, you know, we heard one resignation tonight. Um, you know, now more than ever, we would really love to have a fully staffed nursing department, um, and we didn't have that pre-COVID, um, and we still remain, you know, uh, understaffed in the nursing department, but this is a pandemic, and, you know, that's another huge concern uh, that we have as far as what it actually looks like in the buildings. Um, and then, you know, as we've talked about tonight, the custodial staff, really any staff member, principals, IAs, nurses, if you've got that one symptom, you're out. And, and now we have a substitute in place. I, I don't know how many substitutes um, are actually going to come into the building when, when we get to that point where, where they're actually being asked to enter a building with students. Um, but I'm concerned about that and, and teachers are definitely concerned about that. Uh, and then the other side of it is even if we really are fully staffed and, and we've got everyone in the building, um, it's still, I, and we don't feel like it's gonna be what, what we're looking for. Um, all these requirements, um, you know, first of all, teachers are gonna be on edge regarding the mask wearing and, and the social distancing. I mean, I mean we're, we're terrified of getting sick and bringing that home to our families. And so teachers are gonna be on edge. Um, and I think students who are really gonna be affected are those that uh, sometimes struggle to follow rules. Um, I think it's gonna be really hard that they're not gonna have that same patient uh, response from a teacher that they normally would because teachers are gonna be really scared. And this is a potential matter of life and death. And um, that's gonna bring out a different response in, in our teachers. Um, and I think those students are really gonna struggle with that. Um, plus, they're gonna be hangry, so that will have that to deal with as well. Um, there's gonna be a lot of screen time at school. Um, we've, we've heard about the, you know, the ways to work in groups, the ways to uh, meet with a small group. Um, you can only do that via virtual means because of the six foot distancing. Um, you know, even turning in assignments is gonna have to be done on, on an iPad and maybe we can take pictures, but um, it's gonna be a lot of screen time at school. Um, and then we're, we're really thinking about that social emotional learning aspect um, we know that's a priority, but we haven't yet seen a plan for how do you do that when you're socially distanced and, and you're, you know, you're wearing a mask. How, how, do, how does social emotional learning look and work? Um, how will we do that effectively? Um, I mean, even, even just socialization, like building friendships is going to be tough from six feet away. Um, so, you know, I, I just want to get up here and express where we're at and why we're feeling this way. Um, teachers are certainly not afraid of hard work. I mean, so many have given up so much time to work for free over the summer uh, to try and, and pull plans together. It's not, it's not hard work that we're afraid of. 
um, I mean, it's, it's getting a disease and, and it's protecting our, our students and our families as well. So uh, I, I hope that helps you. Um, you know, you guys are the decision makers in, in this situation. So uh, I'm just appealing to you on that front. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. Thank you, Thank you so much, Craig. We are listening. We, we, I know a lot of us have been talking to a lot of, a lot of teachers and stuff as well. So um, we are taking all of that in, into account. But thank you for your, for your words. You're already on your way up, Melissa Roush from Whittier. Is this good? Yeah. Yep. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for your time this evening and your openness for dialogue outside of these meeting, meetings. It's extremely uh, beneficial as a parent to know that the board and our superintendent is willing to have that dialogue with us. Um, I understand the gravity in front of you in this process and the tireless work that you all continue to put in. This morning I wrote to you some of my concerns related to the inequity of education that was being offered to the almost 25 percent of students in the online academy because as had been previously stated the enrollment of those classes could have exceeded the size of classes in pre-COVID in-person learning. I was happy this evening to hear that you had reevaluated that plan and the number of 30 students is not likely to be so. Um, and I continue to encourage you to look at those numbers uh, because those numbers online are not best practice just as they're not best practice in person. And I strongly encourage you to continue looking at those numbers and in this time have the numbers in the online academy reflect the pandemic numbers of in-person learning as well uh, because it presents a challenge to our students uh, to learn remotely. And it's not a choice they are making on their own. It is, a, you know, they are it's part of their circumstance and we want to provide them with an equitable education. So I understand fully and completely that your finances are stretched in areas that you guys would never have expected before. However, I do strongly urge you to reconsider the staffing of the online academy to ensure that you can cap those class sizes um, and mirror in-person learning class sizes. I am also here tonight wearing red, not because I just like to shop at Target and that's where I get my masks, but as a sign of support for my brothers and sisters in District 58. I understand that ISB has made recommendations and appreciate that Dr. Russell refers to these guidelines as he continues this work with his leadership team. I too have printed each of these two documents, annotated them, color coded, and spent countless hours scouring over them as an educator in another district working on task forces. I know that these are recommendations, but I urge you to make sure that you look at these recommendations and not follow the minimum. They are minimum guidelines for the safety and health and well-being of our students and our faculty. They are the minimum. So as we look at these guidelines and refer to these guidelines, I strongly encourage you in this process to listen to your faculty and staff as they are extremely valuable stakeholders in this process. Listen to their concerns about their safety and the safety of our children and please work to do more, to be safer, to be the safest that we can be. These are our children, these are my children, but they are also the teacher's children the moment they walk through the door, the moment they turn on the Zoom. It is with every intention that our faculty and our staff questions, pushes, encourages for you to do more. So please listen. And if we have to pause and pivot, look to them for recommendation. Look to them as the guide. ISBE has not been known to give us specific details, but our teachers, our staff, our valuable stakeholders can give us great guidance in this journey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
At this time, I will read any public comments that have been submitted remotely through the Google form. Um, we currently have six that have been submitted. The first one here is from Steve Rausch at Highland. Members of the DG58 board, thank you for taking my comment. I have a child within, district, uh, within the DG58 district. In addition, as a public high school teacher in the, er in the area and as a teacher with many friends who are teachers, I have been able to see how multiple districts in several states try to manage the issue and how to conduct school this fall. I can say without a doubt that the DG58 plan is the most complicated, confusing I have come across. For kids in grades one through six, the length of the school day changes within the first month of school. How does this help students reestablish their daily structure in school? If the goal is to have students in school so parents can work, how does school for two and a half hours for six days help these parents? While most of the new cases of COVID are in central and southern Illinois, what is to prevent a surge in cases in the area? The state saw nearly 2,200 new cases in, on August 8th. If the school would shift to remote learning to start the year, as many districts have done, including the one I work for, it would alleviate much of the anxiety parents feel about how to best manage the return to learning plan. Is district leadership merely waiting for Governor Pritzker to close the schools for in-person instruction? If this is the case, the board and the district leadership have abdicated their responsibilities in acting in the best interest of their students, teachers, and staff. Remote learning would be the best option for the health of our children and educators. It would provide the consistency that is extremely important for children to learn and would eliminate the risk of cases spiking in the area. Dana Jablonski from Henry Puffer. For students who are attending in person and are required to quarantine for 10 days due to exhibiting a certain symptom, how will missed lessons curriculum content be made up? Will the work be sent home? Will these families have access to remote learning during this time? Janine Smith of Highland and Herrick. As a parent, I need to know some of the district plans for the following. If a student starts off on campus, can they then move to remote learning, especially if things are unsafe it's when schools reopen? Is it possible to make the school day back to 8.30 to 12.30 so the kids aren't hungry? Let's be honest, no one is learning if they are hungry. A fruit break isn't gonna cut it. What is the plan if a child doesn't have COVID and a, cl doesn't have COVID and a classmate tests positive? Does the whole class quarantine and work remotely? And what is the plan, what is the plan when things are shut down? What is the plan for teachers who end up having COVID? Do you get a sub? What is the plan for teachers who end up being sick longer than maybe the 10 sick days? It appears there are a lot of unknowns. I'm concerned we are forgetting about kids K through five could be spreading the virus to adults and kids with no symptoms. What happens when you lose all your teaching staff? Is learning and education more important than health at this point? Truly, there are safe ways to learn. While we are, you are giving parents and students the option of learning, the safest options are not being given to all teachers, staff, and families. Please make the dis right decision for, for all so less humans are sick and everyone can grow and learn. I imagine your teaching staff doesn't need to be micromanaged and I'm hopeful that you can do better and do the right thing. Um, this next one is anonymous. It does not show a school. If one of the goals is to minimize transitions for students and staff, more consideration needs to be given to the transition at the trimester for families who have chosen to begin remotely out of safety concerns given the current increase in cases. Students may have a teacher in the online academy who is not a teacher at their building and would be grouped with students across buildings. The hope is eventually all of our students will be able to return safely and they should not also have to transition to another teacher and a different group of students. Alan Do Doherty at Pierce Downer and Herrick. Please consider tabling the sale of art equipment, including kilns at this time. Public discussion has, uh, has been next to impossible with all of the other plans that needed to be made. Maybe take it up once again, once the sc school year gets going. Thank you. And our final public comment here is Kristen Herter from Henry Puffer and Herrick. I am a District 58 parent and I also sub in District 58. To my knowledge, substitute teachers have not been surveyed to see whether or not they'd be willing to sub on site. How can you be sure that you will have enough subs to support the modified on-site option? 
Will subs be needed for remote learning? The last question I have is, when a student is home, having to quarantine for a variety of reasons, who will deliver the student's synchronous instruction? Thank you. Um, as always, a lot of this stuff in includes questions. We will make sure that Dr. Russell, you and your team have all of this data as well so that anyone can be followed up with. Um, at this time, uh, how am I looking on, on time, Melissa? Um, good question. I think it's only been about 20 minutes. Okay. Is there anyone else in the audience today that wishes to make a public comment? Okay. We have one. Oh, please go up to the podium. State your name and attendance area, please. My name is Sumit Tutia. I have a uh, daughter's a kindergartner and a middle school student. Um, and I'm sure that all of you, I'm more concerned about the middle school student at the moment. The, in middle school, the majority of you, including Emily and Garrett and maybe Gregory and all of you may have, um, science, during science class, you might have done a dissection or anything and you were able to find the uh, adaptations and anomalies between certain creatures who say the frog is this way and the rat is this way or something along those lines. How is that supposed to be addressed? Because one thing that I had also noticed is that one of my friends who was in, I went to Herrick and when uh, when having gone to Herrick, one of my friends had uh, decided that they, the enjoyment of it led them to become a forensic scientist. So unless we're looking for something that detracts from the forensic scientists in the future, um, is there any way that we can ensure that this that, that learning that was part of it, and I, I remember that was a small aspect for me, but larger for other people, is something that we can also ensure continues going forward? Well, thank you for your question. Um, if you wouldn't mind uh, taking the opportunity to fill out that card with your contact information, I would really like to have um, a member of Dr. Russell's staff follow up with you on exactly what that's going to look like. But I think that some of those, those lessons and what we're going to continue to do is something that we're going to continue to get updates on as we begin to roll out um, and, and get a lot more detail. But we, I would, if you can fill out that card, we would be happy to make sure that someone follows sure. up directly with your specific question. Okay. But I think that that's something that we're going to have to continue to have right. um, on our docket as we continue to talk about the reopening the schools. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm keeping everyone comfortable and moving past the recess. Keep Continue. Going. Keep going. Beautiful. All right, uh, we have some minutes to approve tonight. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? No. If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the July 13th, 2020 regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Second. Is there any discussion? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the minutes of the July 13th, 2020 regular meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of July 30th, 2020 special meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the minutes of the July 30th, 2020 special meeting as presented. Next up is a consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills and summary as presented in the packet of materials? So moved. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? No, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. In that consent agenda tonight was uh, a, a new personnel hire. So, Dr. Russell, if you want to. 
Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Board President Hughes. Uh, the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education just appointed Lauren Hartilius as Behavior Support Systems Coordinator. She will begin on August 17th. Hartilius joins District 58 with 12 years of direct experience teaching students with emotional disabilities in the Kendall County Special Education Cooperative. She was the lead teacher of South Berwyn District's 100 uh, ED program and most recently provided guidance and direction to both middle and high school specialized programs as the educational coordinator in Morton School District 200. Her passion for helping students with more significant behaviors and emotional needs began early in her career when she worked at an alternative school. She is described as an innovative, knowledgeable, patient, supportive, and committed to supporting students with intensive needs to help them become successful. The District 58 interview teams, composed of teachers, related service staff, and administrators, were especially impressed with her knowledge of supporting students with significant emotional disabilities and experience as a leader in the field. Tilius earned her bachelor's in journalism from Indiana University and a master's in special education from NIU. Most recently, she completed her educational leadership certification from North Central College. The selection process was uh, noted as rigorous as it spans several months with ongoing review of qualified candidates. Uh, we are thrilled to welcome Lauren, uh, said Jessica Stewart, Assistant Superintendent of Special Services. She brings a tremendous amount of experience, insight, and passion in helping students gain success in school using evidence-based strategies and practices, positive relationship building, and by staying up to date with current researches and practices. Ms. Sartilius will directly support students, staff, and families who participate in the district's behavior, emotional, and social training program, which we refer to as the BEST program. Additionally, she will work system-wide to strengthen behavioral support systems for all students. Welcome to our team. I'd like to introduce her. You can't avoid it. You got to come up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was really happy. I was able to be here tonight and meet everyone. Um, I'm very excited to start next week. I can't wait. Um, I'm really excited to be uh, joining the team here. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank, thank you very much. You're welcome. Welcome. You're welcome. All right, we have a couple of items up for action tonight. Uh, the first one is the amended 2020 through 2021. Uh, school calendar. Is there a motion to approve the amended 2020 through 2021 school calendar as presented? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? I, the, the major shift seems to be the beginning of the school year. Was there any downstream implications at the, either any of the breaks or end of the school year that we should be aware of? Yeah, so actually the um, you, you, Karat is right. Uh, we, we obviously had to recode the calendar because of planning days, but the real emphasis behind this change is there's a new law in Illinois which makes uh, the November elections a school holiday. Uh, we cannot have uh, any staff present on those days uh, with a new school holiday requirement. So what this actually does is, is have that holiday in, in November for the election. Uh, please know this is not for municipal elections moving forward. It's just for those federal elections that we would see in November. And so what we did was we added a day to the end of the school year, uh, which actually worked out quite well because if you recall, none of us were thrilled that the school year was ending on a Monday. It usually doesn't you know, do well, so this puts that date uh, on a Tuesday versus a Monday. Uh, so, so that is what that's for. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the amended 2020 through 2021 school calendar as presented. Next up is policy 5 colon 222 tutoring professional service providers. Is there a motion to adopt policy 5 colon 222 tutoring slash professional service providers as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right. Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt policy 5 222 tutoring professional service providers as presented. Um, next up is a serious hazard designation. Is there a motion to designate the areas listed as hazardous for the 2020 through 2021 um, year, which makes students who reside within the designated areas eligible for fee based transportation services? even though they live within the one and a half mile limit. 
So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All right, let's please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to designate the areas listed as hazardous for the 2020 through 2021, which makes students who reside within the designated areas eligible for fee-based transportation services, even though they live within the one and one half mile limit, K through eight. There is no recommendation for action tonight on the return to learn plan for 20 through 2021, but we will continue that dialogue as we go into the next meeting. Um, all right, we do have a couple of announcements tonight. The first, uh, we have some dates to take note of. One is Monday, August 24th at 7 p.m. is the budget workshop, which will take place at the Longfellow Center. Monday, August 31st at 3.45 p.m. will be the district leadership team, also at the Longfellow Center. Friday, September 4th at 7 a.m. will be the financial advisory committee, which will take place over Zoom. And Monday, September 14th at 7 p.m. will be our next regular board meeting, which will be right here at Village Hall. Uh, now we're gonna move into closed session. The board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move into closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the District 5 ILCS 122C1, the placement of individual students in special education programs and other matters related to the individual students, 5 ILCS 122C10, and discussion of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purposes of approval by the body of the minutes or for the semi-annual review of the minutes is mandated by section 2.06, 5 ILCS 122C21. Is there a, a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hanna. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. The board will now move into closed session after a short recess. Let's meet back up at 9.35. To action, uh, returned up the uh, open session here at 10.02 p.m. All we got left to do is get a motion to adjourn. So move. No, we do need to. Oh, oh for a minute. They're not on. They're not on. Oh, act, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm on the other page. Okay, good. Try. <laughs> I got, I got, over, I got overzealous there. All right. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from the July 13, 2020 closed session meeting and keep them permanently closed due to the confidential nature of the comments or the contents? So move. Second. All right, Melissa, will you please go roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Abstain. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. Now is there a motion to adjourn? I move to close the meeting. Second. All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannah. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The meeting is now adjourned.